Hello and welcome to the deepest dive from MinMax. I'm Ben Hansen, joined by Serial Vasquez. Hi. Jeff Markiafava. Hey. And Kyle Hilliard. Hello. The deepest dive. That's right. Woo. We're going to go as deep as humanly possible talking about a game. And not just one game, but we're going to take that game, subdivide that. We're talking all about one of the greatest games of all time, Chrono Trigger. But not the entire game. We're talking about up until you hit the end of time. Right. Mm -hmm. One particular time period in our playthrough. Of well, uh, our time three, period right? represents three different time yeah, periods. That's right. <laughs> and a glimpse into a fourth. It's One timeline, though. That's right. Uh, I do want to point out out of the gate that I did a quick Twitter poll. 51% of people playing with us have never played Chrono Trigger before. Wow. wow. Isn't that amazing? That's way more than I thought. Yeah, yeah it was a cool. huge refrain. It was either people leaving comments on the Patreon page saying, like, this is my first time playing, or saying I haven't played in so long and I've never finished it. I've tried starting it a thousand times. Kind of your your problem there, yeah. Kyle. So I want to point out, no spoilers for later. Even if you're leaving comments on the YouTube version, please be cool. Don't spoil anything. I've edited out all spoiler, spoilers along the way because also bigger fan is people saying, like, I'm really interested in this story, much more than I expected Yeah. because I've heard so many things about Chrono Trigger, but I wasn't expecting to be invested in this story from 1995. But um, speaking of YouTube comments, if you're watching this on YouTube, Thank you. I'm glad you found it. If you look at the running time of this and say, sweet Jesus, <laughs> there is no God, and you want to listen to this as a podcast, uh, you can do that by supporting MinMax on Patreon, uh, patreon.com slash MinMax. Two ends. Two ends. Two ends. Yeah. Wow, very good. What if we shook it up? So I started saying, like, two, and then you finished ooh, and then you say ooh. N, and then you say S. Let's so make it's like, this harder to do Patreon.com. Oh, okay. Okay, I can't botch it out of the gate, though. Patreon.com slash... Min Max to two two ends. That's beautiful. Uh, that <laughs> Anyways, terrible. but if you support us at the five dollar tier, then you get access to the audio version of the deepest dives moving forward. Also, the back catalog we did Outer Worlds last time. Um, also, bonus audio, uh, Min Facts, like basically a bonus weekly podcast. Uh, all long form YouTube videos, max spoilers, audio versions of that, so please check it out. And if you support us at any level, any tier, then you can leave comments for future installments of The Deepest Dive, because we have two more chunks of Chrono Trigger to, to talk through. Yeah. Great. Chrono Trigger. Uh, we should probably do a little table setting here first, right? Mm -hmm. um, personally, I love this game, but I was trying to do the math. I don't think I've finished this game since playing on an emulator in probably the year 2000. Yeah. 80. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. So it has been a long time. And I think like 10 years ago, I tried replaying it and got to the Massa and Mune fight. Mm. Hopefully that doesn't count as a spoiler for anybody, but you fight some... The names of characters. Yeah. Um, and then stop there. So things are pretty hazy. Like to the point that starting it up, this is so stupid, but I was like, oh yeah, I genuinely completely forgot about this character's even name. You know, so things are hazier than I expected. Yeah. Well, did you rename them all though, like Butt when you? Yeah, were that's right. I'm like, 2000. I don't remember her being named Butt. No, specifically, <laughs> it was playing it and then being like, "Oh God, I, we have to talk about Chrono Trigger. I have to figure out if it's Marley or Marl." <laughs> <laughs> like, but I didn't remember that was her name because it's just like, oh, of course, you know, the, the princess. Yeah. Um, but is, well, is it? I think it's Marl. I, think, I always like, said I always read it as Marl, but okay, good. Like yeah. that movie, Marl and Me. <laughs> Marl and Me. That's spelled differently, yeah. though, right? Yeah. M A R L E Y for the movie. Yeah. Anyways, that's my experience <laughs> with the game. Uh, Kyle, Perfect. where were you coming from? Uh, my first time playing it was also an emulator, oh. Oh, but I didn't. I never Not finished boring. it, and then I got an actual physical copy of it and played it on a Super Nintendo on a television. And probably got about halfway through. Okay. And then when it came out on DS, I picked it up and started it again. And it was one of those weird situations where I put it down. Got really far, got further than I'd ever gotten, put it down, and then like two or three years later, randomly picked it back up and finished it, which I do occasionally with like random games. So that and that was like two thousand eight, two thousand nine was okay. when I finished on, on DS. Yes, yeah. that's, that's where I am. I played it through and after a couple of false starts. And now you're playing it on. I'm playing it on iPhone. I hate that. It's well, why you? I, I'm surprised because, you hate it because I, it's. Novel, it's weird, yeah. but I feel like you're gonna have a lesser experience. It's tougher to get absorbed but in a mobile I've, game and especially an iPhone I've, game. I've played it before already. Yeah. You know, like I don't know. But I, like, I want you to feel it this time, man. Oh, okay. For the I, first time. I think it's it's interesting to be playing it on a phone. Um, it's definitely. I think it is like easily the worst version of it. Um, but I mean, it's a turn-based RPG, so it's not like I'm being held up that much by like you know struggling to move Chrono through the over you know with the overhead camera through the environment and stuff. Right. Like that. But right. the big fault is like the. 
the fonts and the text are not updated to be pixelated, which looks pretty rough. Yeah, well, here yeah. we go. We got Hugo H2P right again saying, hey, this is my first time ever playing Chrono Trigger, and after much debate, I went with the iOS version. <laughs> Keep it simple. Uh, and honestly, there's some surprising choices on that port. The font and general UI and lack of consistent pixel density often makes the whole thing feel like an RPG maker project, and I'd love to know <laughs> if the battle system is as hectic on other systems as it is on iPhone, having to touch and tap rap rapidly all around. It does feel a little more hectic because it's an update that they added in the last like year, I guess, where you can tap on enemies on screen to oh, attack okay. them that way, yeah. which is easier than using the fake D-pad. Wait, but it does still make it kind of chaotic. So on the iPhone, uh, on the iPhone version, the one with the touch screen, they just recently added the ability to touch I, stuff. I, well, no, I mean, there's, it's usually it was always just like uh, a virtual D-pad. And oh, then you can okay. touch so, the right side of the screen to press A. That seems like the one really benefit you'd get out of it, though, is like right. being yeah. able to click directly on the enemies instead yeah, of Yeah, so that's kind of a recent update, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And yeah. I'm playing on Steam, and uh, I am totally fine with that version. By the way, uh, Samuel Stanton wrote in saying they're playing for the first time. Oh, for people playing for the first time, that Square Enix's games are on sale right now for PC on Humble Bundle. Oh, so cool. you can get mm -hmm. Chrono Trigger for uh, seven fifty. It was nice they in. did that for our deepest dive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that was very Thanks, generous Square. of them. So if you're listening to this podcast having not purchased Chrono Trigger yet, <laughs> get on it. Uh, but I'm playing on Steam, and I know... I remember that version being bad out of the gate, but I went back and looked at like Game Informer's new gameplay today that we recorded back when it first came out. It was such an abomination. I totally get why there's that stigma, but playing it... Like, the health bar in some of the UI will drive me a little bit nuts. And there's, like, a one-pixel line on the top of the frame where it's, like, there's, you know, it's letterbox, but then it, like, goes to 16.9 with, like, one pixel. It's a very specific thing. But, like, those are really my only two complaints. Other than that, I think it's awesome on Steam. But, Jeff, what is your history with Crown Trigger? Uh, I started it, like, 15 years ago. And, and I, went, I went into this thinking I didn't get very far, yeah. is the short story. I went into this thinking I didn't remember anything, but there were a couple things, you know, like every now and then I'd be like, oh, yeah, I did get to this far when I played through it. And I kind of remembered little bits and pieces, but the entire plot, I I was being surprised by revelations as they yeah. were coming up that I probably should Wait, have Wait, his name is Chrono? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah, that's what we're here to talk about is the fact that there's no H in his name. Yeah, that's going to be at least an hour of this conversation. Mm -hmm. um, you're a big Super Nintendo boy. Yes. <laughs> How did you dodge this back in the day? I uh, it, I didn't play a lot of RPGs when I was a kid. I played Secret of Mana was was the one that my brother and I. Because like ended action up. enough and co-op and. I it we didn't even think that far through. Like I think yeah. I borrowed it from a friend and we ended up beating it together. But otherwise, it was more of the Legend of Zelda and actiony games. Sure. Sure. Uh, but I'm playing on DS this time. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, interesting. And that version seems okay for you? Yeah. Awesome. I think that might be the best version, honestly. It's if you don't mind like handheld it? gaming, yeah. You, well, okay, sure. Yeah, that, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Serial, what do you got, man? Uh, so I pl the really only time I, I played Chrono Trigger was on the DS a while ago. Like I think back when it first came out, but I I didn't even make it past the fair. I didn't really play that much of it. <laughs> what really? Uh, yeah, and this then, is impossible. <laughs> uh, so then I just th and I'm playing it now on that same copy actually. So like you know however many years later, uh, and I'm playing it on the 3ds, which is weird that you guys mentioned the text because I think I'm also having a slight problem with the text, and I think that it's a little blurry. I think it has mm. to do with it being on the 3ds and you know it being the DS version kind of pixelated. Kind of puffed up on the on the DS 3DS XL, yeah. Um, so it's a little hard to read. Uh, but other than that, um, I, I, yeah, I, I, I'm not like. Um, besides that, I don't have I don't have any real complaints. So <laughs> no complaints. Uh, in life, wow. In terms of good. like this version, uh, yeah. You know. Oh, good. Uh, so yeah, a couple of interesting factoids from people. By the way, uh, the amount of feedback we got was overwhelming. I don't think we've ever had a game club, even going back to the Game Informer era, where we had this much feedback. So mm. thanks to everybody that's playing along. It is so sweet to see everybody in the MinMax Discord, which you get access to uh, if you support us in any tier. Um, so, everybody like sharing so pictures. old games are popular for Deepest Dives? I, I, maybe that's clubs? the lesson, yeah. Or just also if we choose one of the greatest games of all time, turns out people helps, are like, because yeah. everyone is just like, oh yeah, this is finally my excuse to blast through it. Uh, Jose Gabriel... A man toy, I'm sorry, writes in saying, Hello, Min Max. I wasn't even born yet when this game came out. 
It is now only, however, that I can take a deep dive into Game Informer's third greatest RPG of all time. <laughs> Remember that old debate? That was oh, fun. Oh, yeah. We were all there for that. Oh, yeah. Uh, Robert Figueroa says, I play this game every year to remind me of simpler times and one of the best games ever. Wow. This is sweet. Uh, Christopher Reardon, just for the most complicated setup here. He says, uh, since I don't have a PC or console capable of playing Colonel Trigger, I'm playing the Android version on my phone, casting it to my TV via uh, Chromecast, <laughs> and using a DualShock 4 synced to my phone. Okay. It's kind of a complicated setup, but it's actually working surprisingly well. You know, I actually, by next week, I'll try to um, play with a controller, see if I can connect it to my phone, see how that plays out. Yeah? Yeah. That sounds good. Um, and then... Also, uh, Brian Peritis says, this is my first time playing the game, but I've wanted to play it for years, so thank you for giving me an excuse. Hey, You're that's what we're here for. I know that Kyle likes fast player movement. I, yeah, <laughs> I do. Like, <laughs> but I'm playing on PC using an Xbox One controller, and I find it nearly impossible to control Chrono using the analog stick. I keep getting stuck oh. in geometry, especially in the overworld. Yeah, I was having a real tough time with that, too. I think that's, that was a problem even playing it on Super Nintendo. Like, because you have the sort of... Oct- octagonal movements as opposed to Final Fantasy's like yeah you know, but specifically movements. the analog stick I think was a problem because oh, I was yeah. playing with like a 360 controller basically like a, a pro type thingy um, I guess maybe it's Xbox One but I was like I'm having such a time with this and then the D-pad sucks on the specific controller that mm-hmm. I have it's like a Razer Ultimate or something um, and so it turns out somewhere throughout the years I collected like a Sega Genesis controller for PC I think it's for like the Genesis Mini or something <laughs> and so I switched over to that so I know it's sacrilegious to play a Super Nintendo That's game with the weird. Genesis controller but it controls so much better with the Genesis D-pad mm-hmm. than the Xbox One D-pad for that specific Just try using the touch screen really? <laughs> that sounds pretty good you'll hate it <laughs> uh, how much do you guys know about the development history of Chrono Trigger? Uh, Other than like, oh, everyone knows it's a dream team, right? That's yeah, that's about the extent that I know of it. It's yeah. just like you know, uh, very important people at Square coming together with uh, Toriyama, Dragon Ball creator, to make something novel and like difficult to repeat. You know, right? Well, yeah. except for Blue Dragon, which is the only game to have surpassed uh, Chrono Trigger in its <laughs> yes. legacy. We all love Blue Dragon and its affiliated anime. I Our number one <laughs> RPG of all time. <laughs> Remember they made the DS game too? Yeah, yeah. I want to play more Blue Dragon. I tried it. I I want to like it. Anyways, let's not focus on Blue (laughs) Dragon right now. Uh, So the origins of the project, uh, just for a 30,000-foot view here, it's Sakaguchi, Final Fantasy creator, director, moving back throughout the eras, and Yuji Horii, uh, Dragon Quest man. So Mr. Final Fantasy and Mr. Dragon Quest, uh, they met up and talked about collaborating and then also roped in Akira Toriyama. Obviously, if you can't tell, a Dragon Ball artist. uh, Yeah. Godfather of Dragon Ball. Um, and then they just kept pulling in more people. So they had, um, like, Masato Kato, who wrote... So Yuji Hori wrote, like, the overall rough uh, version. And then this Kato guy apparently went through and wrote, like, the detail and actually the event planner script, all that stuff. So he went on to work on, like, Xenogears, Chrono Cross, Final Fantasy VII. And then a couple years ago, I didn't know this at all, he released an iOS game that is called Another Eden, The Cat Beyond Time and Space, which is like a spiritual successor to Chrono Trigger. Oh. I, mm. I'd be curious to check it out, too. Um, but then, obviously, Takahashi, who went on with the Xeno series, uh, he also was uh, involved with the graphics and the graphic design for Chrono Trigger. But uh, we actually met one of the co-directors of the game, because there were three directors for Chrono Trigger. And when Joe Juba and Kimberly Wallace and I were visiting Square for like a full week for the Final Fantasy XV cover story trip, we got to meet uh, Tokita, Takashi Tokita, who is the co-director of Chrono Trigger. Mm. And we actually talked to him about Chrono Trigger, which was a, a real thrill. And there's the interview on Game Informer's website that Joe Juba wrote up and stuff. But he gives a little bit of the background of how it came to be, if you're interested in this type of thing. So he says, it's probably considered sacred, Chrono Trigger is, in the series, since the companies merged. It was essentially a dream mix between Final Fantasy and Dragon Quest. Creating or exceeding what it was in its original form is a very difficult feat. So the idea of, like... So this is, Enix this was and Square for the merger, right? Mm-hmm. Enix oh, and Square were two right. separate entities, yeah. and they collaborated on this. And then since the merge, I think everybody involved in the company is like, "Wow, that's like a weird, a sacred thing. That's like almost like a vision of the future, no pun intended, of where this company was going." Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. But then he says, once everyone was done developing Final Fantasy VI, hordes of staff helped out on Chrono Trigger. He says, at the end, we had a couple hundred working on the game at the same time. It was kind of like a grand festival. It was really fun. Tetsuya Nomura, who we know from Final Fantasy fame, uh, was actually creating the environment background pieces in Chrono Trigger, like the courthouse sequence that was created by him. But everyone probably enjoyed how we were able to do things we never done the Chrono Trigger. 
And then uh, we talked about like if it's ever going to come back, the classic problem of what are you doing, Square? Why are you not respecting yeah, your legacy yeah. with Chrono? Uh, and he says, personally, if there ever is an opportunity, I would love to see a high-quality, high-end version of Chrono Trigger or a movie production or something like that. Hmm. And I remember him talking about like the movie idea specifically, and he's like, yeah, Hollywood has um, has talked to us about making a Chrono Trigger movie a couple times throughout the years, which is fascinating. But he's like, but the problem is that they're going for like billion dollar franchise, so they are trying to convert it into like Lord of the Rings scale, you mm. know, or just this monumental epic, which it could be. But then the problem is like, yeah, we can't get three hundred million dollars at least to create a Chrono Trigger movie, you know? Yeah. So it's like that's what's eating that process. But I don't even know if I want a Chrono Trigger movie. Yeah, and that so. that seems very weird that like Hollywood would be interested in that. Like I understand like everyone wants this giant series now, but for them to home in on Chrono Trigger, like who's driving that conversation in I'm Hollywood? I'm sure everybody who owns any scrap of IP. I mean Hollywood producers have come to the Minmax studio and said we want well, to turn yeah. Min Snacks into <laughs> the Hollywood blockbuster <laughs> yeah. it deserves. I said only Matt Damon <laughs> uh, yeah, it's an odd choice, but I guess like, oh, time travel epic, but seeing like Frog in a real movie would be horrifying. Uh -huh. But I would love to see like a full Netflix series that's done with the Toriyama art. Like, I think yeah, there's a lot just, of potential there. I mean, it would just have, that would be the best way, right? Just a Toriyama anime? Yeah, right? absolutely. I mean, and so they had uh, like a mini series, it was like 20 minutes that they produced back in the 90s or 2000s. But the weird thing was, it was animated as like a special, but it focused on like enemies from Chrono Trigger. It wasn't like, there was like Perfect. a brief scene where you get to see the characters, but then the rest of it's like, let's tell the story of Gato singing around this fair and stuff like that. I was like, what the hell? Weird. All right. Odd choice. Yeah. <clears throat> so we have a ton of feedback from people. <clears throat> and as always, uh, thank you for playing along with us, for submitting feedback. It's super fun to read through all this stuff. I'm sorry if I just took a chunk of yours, but it turns out so many people wrote about the trial. So many people wrote about Robo. Mm -hmm. It's like, I need to limit this a little. Yeah. Um, but uh, as always, the more specific, the better for the feedback. That's what we love is when people are really specific. I'm looking at this cable because it's like wrapped around in a weird way and I just want to make sure it's okay. Anyways, um, so... We're here to celebrate the specific, everybody. Like Let's do your it. odds go up so much higher if you write in about something, not some BS nonsense, but something you actually care about and notice that's just a tiny moment that no one else has written about. Mm. You know what I mean? So keep that in mind for future episodes um, and installments of The Deepest Dive. So starting out, just kind of broad overview, the opposite of a specific. Right. Uh, Seth Walker writes in saying, hey, Chrono Trigger has been my favorite JRPG of all time. The lack of attention that Square Enix has paid the universe over the decades since its release has always perplexed me. It's on the level of Nintendo ignoring the Mother franchise. <laughs> the thing that has always stood out to me about the opening of the game is how it seamlessly blended fantasy and sci-fi into, into an enticing package that immediately gripped me and made the game feel different from the scads of fantasy-themed RPGs of the era. The medieval setting blended with the Star Trekian technology. Luca is toying around with an immediate jump into time travel, which also seemed like it was handled in a very Star Trek fashion. It plays with all the tropes of the RPG genre, the silent male protagonist, the stoic knight figure like Frog, the plucky princess, Marl, and the best friend, Luca. But what it does with those well-worn tropes is provide some of the best written versions of these archetypes that have graced the genre. I think that's very well said. Yeah. I, I think that the the world uh, building thing specifically, something that Akira Toriyama does uh, like stupendously well. I think even Dragon Ball and Dragon Ball Z are are like worlds that feel um, like they're from two distinct time periods. Where it's like here are dinosaurs, but also there's this modern city and all this technology and like you know the Capsule Corporation stuff. And and here they do a really good job of making it feel kind of like out of time, which you know which is a pun here, but like also it works in Dragon Ball where it's like I don't know when this is supposed to take place, other than like obviously it was made in the '80s, so a lot of the cars look like 80s cars. I know exactly when it's supposed to take place. I'd say 1,000. <laughs> well, but like... <laughs> what does that mean? But right, it's like the right. aesthetic of it feels like, <clears throat> okay, this could be any period in time, yeah. really, that isn't yeah. like the modern world. And you think that comes just with Toriyama's art, where it's like, well, the Dragon Ball thing is just mashing all these time periods together, so mm -hmm. it has to be the Chrono Trigger vibe a little bit as well. Yeah. Yeah. I think he's just, yeah, his art is just good for mashing, like you said, dinosaurs next to cars. Like, it doesn't feel weird, and Chrono Trigger is, like, all about that. Like, especially that monster as we get, mash? Yeah, yeah, especially when we get further into it, when you're, like, going more further into the future and deeper into the past and stuff. Like, it all is consistent. Yeah. Know? Actually, Bob Buell has a interesting point that ties directly to this he says okay so at the fair in the beginning when you first walk into the town 
Two different looking knights, a cat, and a green reptite are running around the square. This is my third playthrough of this game, and every time I played previously, for whatever reason, I assumed the reptite was a person in costume. But now, listening to some other people in town talk about how monsters coexist with humans, and setting specifically that weird piano-playing monster thing in the bar that no one seems to talk about, <laughs> I don't know what's going on anymore. I think it is kind of a coexisting thing where yeah. they still... It's a peaceful era, I guess, right? I guess, yeah. yeah. I guess that's the overall vibe, right? Uh, very specifically to Joe Juba, friend of the Who? show. Mm. Yeah. Jo- Jose Hune, I'm sorry, okay. wrote in saying, I don't know how this is programmed Hello, under the hood, but each runner in the foot race of the Millennial Fair presumably has a one in four chance of winning each time. Even so, I always pick the green ambler. <laughs> <laughs> so that freak is Joe's boy, baby. Yeah, I can see that. Um, just the tone, I think, is the biggest thing that stands out to me is starting this game. It's like, And I think that Seth was totally right where – I don't really like fantasy unless it's Redwall. <laughs> that's, like, the okay. yeah, that's the I one. That's the one. I guess I I, kind of for me too. I, I haven't really grown up on too much of that stuff, and so playing so many 16-bit JRPGs back in that era, it was like, okay, like I'm on board. Like there's some steampunk elements within Final Fantasy VI and the opening and stuff, but so many of those was like, I, I'm sick of castles. I'm sick of this, and so this game just popped in such a big way, and the lighthearted tone from the outset just immediately captured my imagination. Yeah, you don't. I mean, you. You did not see a lot of sci-fi anything back in like the Super Nintendo era, like what do you mean? like maybe shooters, you know. But in terms of an RPG kind of or a turn-based any kind of well, game, Fantasy Star fans, I'm sure, are screaming. But sure, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> that's a gap in my knowledge. No, that's but, very fair. Uh, yeah, it's it's just refreshing. It feels yeah. so different, right? Yeah. It was. I mean, around the time I think both Dragon Quest and Final Fantasy were like steeped in the fantasy parts of uh, of it, right? Like, yeah, you know, we we had Final Fantasy VI, which was like you know a little bit more you know like steeped in yeah. yeah, but yeah. it was it was just a, they were just starting to make that shift from like fantasy settings to more modern like cyberpunk right. or whatever settings. Uh, I guess, what do you guys think of it <laughs> so far? Uh, so we we talked about a couple of different games we want to do for Deepest Dive, yeah. and like I was hesitant about Chrono Trigger just because it's a big RPG, you know. But uh, I so quickly, even playing like just an hour, I was like, oh yeah, I forgot. Like this goes like it moves so well, it's so yeah. much fun, it's so funny. Like it's much funnier than I remember it being. Just animations, just or? Ev- well, just everything. Like I have some notes as we get into it later. Yeah. Just like little jokes that stood out to me that I like. I, like. The game goes back and forth between being serious and funny very uh, easily, right. and it was and it was that thing where it's like the more I play them, I'm like, oh yeah, this is great. Like this is not going to be a problem to get through this game at all because it's just it's so it's like weirdly light and fun, even and though it it's moves. A, yeah, it yeah. goes really quickly, and like you, and yeah, like so I'm I'm enjoying my time revisiting it for sure, yeah. like more yeah. than I thought I would. Yeah, I think the the thing that has stuck out to me the most so far is how much I am invested in the story and enjoying mm. the story. Oh, interesting. And, and I think it's, I think it does a really good job compared to other games where most of the plot points are kind of set up to be revelations that you come to on your own, where you may, you may talk to a person, you know, like at the fair or whatever, and they'll give you a, a random bit of information like, oh, that princess is a real pain in the butt. She's a tomboy. Right. And at the time, I didn't put together that like the person I immediately then met was the princess. Oh, really? You know? yeah. <laughs> and and but it it has continued to do that, you know, with like they're building a bell and and but like and then you realize that it's the bell from the fair or whatever or or right. like the first person you talk another kid is in the fair and he's like, oh, my daddy said that if you know they hadn't defeated this lord so and so. You know, like how many how many ever years ago we wouldn't be having this fair right now? And then it's like, oh, of course, that's the time that you go back to, and now you're kind of seeing those things. The the way that you kind of piece stuff together yeah. in your mind, I think makes makes those plot points stand out more than if it, if it was just directly related. And you. it gives every NPC more power instead of just mm-hmm. saying like, oh. Sure, it's a windy day today. Like, everyone is a potential puzzle or a potential clue to, like, track. Mm-hmm. Of, like, oh, it's I wonder if this is relating to, to the time. Yeah, yeah. and, like, um, Brian Shuda says, I noticed this for the first time while playing the game for the umpteenth time, but after you rescue the queen in 600 AD, the chancellor mentions that, quote, they must include a stricter justice system in this kingdom to ensure fr- uh, fiends never threaten the royal family safety again. 
So that means that the trial that happens for you in 1000 AD is a result of the events of you saving the Queen and Chancellor in 600 AD. I wonder if there are more minute events in the story similar to that and if I'll notice them playing through as an adult now. Yeah, I took note of that as well, but I found it kind of funny that he's like, oh yeah, monsters are attacking us. What we need is a better court system. That, <laughs> that's what'll stop the monsters. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, also, Hugo... H2P says, I'm surprised, though, how open the game is from the get-go. I went to the port and said yes to boarding a boat, just expecting to be met with some sort of restricted <laughs> yeah. reply, but instead I sailed across the continent. There's always the core progression path, but it has such a good bulk of branches, which you are consistently rewarded for exploring with treasures or info. I love the interconnected world building with different ages referencing one another and certain things that keep consistent throughout time. Like the lady in the northmost residence on the starting village through the ages will always say, she's as happy as she will ever be. Hmm. Yeah. Except Bob Buell said that lady really freaked him out because the idea of her being like, I'm as happy as I'll ever be was a very pessimistic tone, but yeah, Bob's just a cynic. <laughs> there's a lot of like those moments of just like darkness. Like like yes. that kind of, cause, like there's one I uh when Marl, Princess Marl is like she like disappears because maybe you don't potentially save her. She 100%. says something along the lines of like, I couldn't see or feel anything, but it was cold. Is that what it's like to die? Yeah. And it's like, oh my God. Mm -hmm. It's like she's being <laughs> torn apart. It's like a Twilight Zone episode yeah. where they're disappearing and she's just screaming in agony. Yeah, I think that was a result of the new translation from the DS translation because I don't remember that either. And granted, it's been 20 years. I mean, I was young. I don't think, I just don't think it would have st stood out to me. I'd been like, oh yeah, it's like Back to the Future. Cool. Yeah. You know, but like now as like an older player, I'm kind of like, yeah, what the what happens when we die? <laughs> I love that. I love any lighthearted story like this where you just the character takes someone's like, no, no, no. Like that was messed up. Like yeah. that was effed up what I just experienced. I saw mm -hmm, beyond mm -hmm. my mortality. Yeah. Yeah. But sorry, sorry, we didn't get to the overall. Take uh, so I far. think when when people talk about like the ways that you know retro games uh, ended up doing a lot with a little, I think this is like a one of those prime examples where um, even though like yeah everything's sprite and like even when you go into that fair. Um, you realize like it's not as big as you think it is, you know, even mm -hmm. going like remembering it or whatever. But they, but I think the reason people kind of remember it as being larger than it is is because I think they do such a good job of like giving you just enough for your imagination to kind of fill in the gaps where it's like, okay, I, here's the illusion of, of a very crowded kind of fair, even though there's maybe like maybe 10 people in that area, like that kind of center area at most. Um, and I think even just like the way the, the characters animate, you know, the way the, like the quote unquote cutscenes where characters are just moving around. It's like very simple, but it's like they, they have such a deft touch in animating those scenes and like the yeah. way characters express. Um, and even like the, I think that I, I like the combat system, but like I think I realize I like it more be for how it's presented than, than what it actually like the intricacies of that combat system. Yeah. I think it's presented so well <laughs> in that like just the, the basic act of like, you don't go into the transition screen and there's like a, you know, here's us on the, on this side, here's them on this side. Even th that basic like aesthetic touch makes everything move so briskly. And I think it complements, you know, how quickly the, the story moves as well. Yeah. And so I like, I'm really digging it. Like I, I'm, I don't, uh, I guess my expectations were like sky high considering like, you know, everyone talks about like, you know, other RPGs that, like don't measure up to this game. So it's like, yeah. you know, I'm not sure where I, I sit with it there. But like so far, I'm like, I'm having fun with the story in a, in a way that like I wasn't expecting to. I expected it to be more dense, but it's like right. there are pieces here um, that that are interesting. And I'm in, and it has like a forward momentum that I'm really enjoying. for sure. Yeah. Joey Markham writes in and says, I love how the game starts off with basically a bunch of accidents. And it's not until a few hours playtime that you start the quote, save the world from Lavos quest. Mm -hmm. in the future. Uh, it's a sort of buildup that you don't see a lot in games, yet Chrono Trigger found ways to make the game compelling the whole time, even before ever starting the, quote, big main mission, mm. right? It's not like your father's getting murdered out of the gate or anything like that, or you have amnesia trying to piece it together, but it's just like, oh, we're just, like, trying to help each other and help our friends, and then we stumble into, oh, turns out there's this huge thing yeah, that we right. can't ignore. Yeah, and, and it's also the cool time travel aspect of, like, we're... We're mostly just trying to fix what we already screwed up by, like, going back in time, you know? And and I, I really enjoyed the aspect of, like, the princess goes back, which you don't even know she's a princess at that point. She gets mistaken for a queen, and then you go to that bar, and you have a conversation with a random guy who's there who's like, hey, I got information about where the queen is. I'll tell you if you buy me a drink. Right. And you do that, and he says, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure she's, you know, like over by this cathedral or, you know, a, a church or whatever. Yeah. And then, so, and then someone comes in and says, oh, we found the queen. And he's like, oh, I guess I was wrong. And it was like, 
that's the guy who would have gone and like found the queen, <laughs> but we screwed that up, and now no right. one's looking for the queen, and the queen's gonna be gone. Right, and it's right. it's just that interesting like mix of time trial, and then that once you make all those rev- revelations in your head, then the mission that you actually have to go do has more meaning. I think yeah. because it's like, well, now now I have to go save this queen because, and I mean that's such a trope, you know. Like we've done that a million times in video games, but this time it actually felt like I had more agency in it, and it was more personal because yeah. we screwed it up. And right. and like and it took me to realize that someone didn't just say, "Oh, the queen is still missing. You have to go find her." It's like, "Oh no, I'm the one who did that." Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Roberto Zaya says, "I have a hard time believing that Marl and her ancestor look and sound that much alike." <laughs> it is. It's basically yeah. the movie Dave. If you've seen that, right? But it's like, especially the king to be like, "Oh, my queen has returned." It's like, man, come on, buddy. It's your own mm-hmm. wife. Yeah, just because she's blonde. Doesn't pay attention that much. Yeah, you know. I guess so. Also, there's a weird moment where like. Chrono, you meet with Marl up in the top, and she's like, hee, 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 Chrono, all that stuff. Mm. And then you head back out and talk to the guards, and they're like, they have some line about, like, you weren't doing anything untoward in there, were mm-hmm. you? It's like, man, just accusing Chrono of going up and making love to the queen? Yeah, <laughs> there were a couple, a couple people like that. And there was also, uh, I wrote down one line um, associated with that, which has not aged well. Oh! Uh, one of the guards says, a great number of things change as the years go by, but if there's one thing that will ever be the same, it's women and their insufferable love of gossip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Even in the new translation, it's like, well, we can't. The Japanese intense there. It's a different time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Melissa Dora says, I love the moment when Marl disappears, a la Marty in Back to the Future, when her relative is in danger. But did it make anyone else feel like something had already happened to her relative? Would it have been a stronger choice to have her to have had her in the party but she kept flickering and fading out as you travel due to the danger that her relative is in. I think that's an interesting idea. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, probably, probably one of those cleaner. really complex ideas that, you know, they may not have had time for. But that, that would have been an interesting way to do that. But I think at that point, you're kind of just struggling with like two or three party members, right? So Right. Yeah. So. yeah. Uh, but it is clearly back to the future rules. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Not, Which not they Avengers explain. Endgame. You know, they, they, they have that cutscene where it's like, well, okay, let's lay out what how time works here by saying, like, okay, look, here are all the descendants. Here is Marl and her, like, line of I descendants. I love that. Yeah, if, cool. she does, if this person dies, and, like, it's like a, obviously this game was made for, like, younger audiences, of course, so they have to go into the, like, I think if Explain that game were made now, bit. they would kind of breeze over that um, explanation. They would say it's back to the future. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Eric Reed says, so the trio viewing the Lavos footage. Remember this? Mm-hmm. Jumping ahead a little bit? future a little bit, yeah creates a time paradox in that if they kill Lavos, they couldn't have seen the footage that motivated them to kill it. But what about the paradox of if Marl, coming back to the past, shreds her because the queen is going to die, but she still inherited her necklace that sent her back in time? Why would she appear and disappear at those specific points without the timeline going sour for Chrono and Luca? Eric, you're smarter than us, and we're just playing the little cute game. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's fair. I mean, yeah, like, I, yeah, I, yeah. every time travel story has its, you know, number of paradoxes. I think the best way that I've ever thought about time is just like it's just a safe state. It's like this is a there are different timelines when you ever whenever you go back in time, it's just a different. Just it, the other timeline. Don't worry about it. Like it's, <laughs> it won't fall apart. It's just just save before you go into the boss. Just yeah. save before you go into the boss. Uh, shuffle guy. Jumping back to the very beginning, uh, he says, Chrono Trigger has always been a game I've heard of, but I've never played. The Deepest Dive gave me a good excuse to finally start this old gem. Thank you. Played it on PC, and oh boy, do I love it. Uh, At the start of the game, your mother opens the curtains and makes you get out of bed. I automatically tried to close the curtains, and heck, the curtains actually closed. 10 out of 10. (laughs) (laughs) I I I did that, too. Little, little, like, touches like that do Mm. make you, like... Like go straight to like ten out of ten, you know. Sometimes because yeah. it's like, oh, they took the time to assume that I would want to manipulate this, and right, you know? yeah. or like just hearing the cat's little meow. It's like that that does it, or like yeah. being able to eat in the kitchen in the past, which we'll get to yeah. later. And then like later on, when you're in the prison, there's like the uh, you can go into one of the jail cells, and there's like a guy in there, and then when you check it, he just kind of falls apart, and it's like, a, oh, yeah, it's a, it was turns out he was a skeleton. Yeah, this whole that was time. awesome. Yeah, I yeah. forgot about that. Hey, that's good specific stuff that no one else wrote in about. You should write in uh, on the Patreon <laughs> page. There he goes. Um, but. Shuffle Guy also says, the Millennial Fair. Why organize a fair every 1,000 years, <laughs> passing around 33 generations before happening again? I know it, it's silly, but at the same time, I think it's a genius timestamp. Because hmm. it's like, even if they had the time of what year it was at the bottom, 
it's so easy to forget, but when the entire beginning is like the Millennial Fair, the Millennial Fair, it's like, okay, now I know that that is 1,000 as the baseline, and now we can figure out exactly yeah, where we are. That was just one that. guy who thought, it'll be the Millennial Fair, this will be my legacy, but I never have to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> I also thought it was Remember weird me. that, as like, you know, they have all these different attractions and minigames that you can play, which is actually pretty cool, but like, and the way they introduce you to the combat system is by having you fight um, Gato, I think was the. Yeah. yeah um, uh, it's weird that they have that in the in the context of the world. It's like, hey, if you guys want to fight this giant robot for like fun fair points, <laughs> like, you can totally do that. Uh, have at it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Forrest Lastman uh, says I wanted to specifically talk about Gato's theme. I could never really hear how the lyrics would work into it until I heard the Japanese version from the Chrono Trigger anime short thing, mm. uh, where his name was Gonzalez, but. Here is because a lot of people wrote in about how much they love Gato and they love the Gato music, which is very true. So in the anime version, this is what it sounds like when Gato sings. Very beautiful. Good. Yeah, good. Gato's, it Gato's no yeah. joke. Speaking of, of, of musical themes, uh, I think Robo's theme later on is like a, I had this weird like where I kept expecting it to turn into Never Gonna Give You Up. Yeah. I've seen uh, yeah, a lot you, of people. Do you know that, that like up. a lot of people no. are obsessed with this? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So uh, let's see. Uh, so yeah, a lot of people have mashed it up. I mean, it, it's very okay. Close. That's a common yeah. thing. Okay. Yes. Cool. Yeah. 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 Uh, let's see, Robert. Yeah, somebody wrote in saying pop or like surprise twist that Robo's actually Robert Astley yeah. or whatever. But then somebody <laughs> asked him, asked Mitsuda, the original composer, if there was a connection there, and he said that he had never heard that song before. Yeah, sorry, Joe Halaska says people evidently noticed that Robo's theme sounds like Rick, Rick Astley's never going to give you up. Years later, Mitsuda was being interviewed by an outlet, and the interviewer played the song for him. Mitsuda said that was the first time he'd ever heard it. And to get out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. This interview is over. <laughs> I knew that like the internet was obsessed with that connection, and I was like, oh, I think it's overblown. But then Robo's theme started, and I was like, Yeah, no, all it's... right, you can't unhear it. Yeah, it's yeah. still a sweet song, but tough. To no one's arguing it's a bad song. That's true. Uh, Hazal Muhammad says it's a small thing, but first time playing the Super Nintendo version, I never realized that the Marl event at the fair was scripted. It wasn't until I played the 3DS version and tried to avoid colliding into her that I realized that this game was trying to do something huge, since it wouldn't continue unless you ran into her. Mm. Uh, did you guys check that out? He I, says, I wonder before, if there are other yeah. things where it's like, yeah, I did it the second time. I booted up just to capture footage real quick. And, like, I tried, like, dodging her, and she's just, like, kind of running in place then for a little bit down yeah. there. But he says, I wonder if there are other moments in the game that are dependent on the subtle illusion of you being in control of the narrative, but really it's the game guiding you along one of the many paths in the masterpiece. For yeah. sure. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we could, should we talk about the trial at this point? Like, I mean... we we'll just save it for a second. Okay. But, like, just on this theme about, like, subtly it's steering your direction, I'm always annoyed, and it's, annoyed, and it's the classic uh, Pokemon sin about being, like, are you excited or are you happy to talk about or any RPG where it's like do you want to continue the adventure mm -hmm. and you choose no and they say come on and it gives you the same prompt yeah. even a beloved game of Chrono Trigger still does that more than I enjoy yeah. where they give me an option I try and say I'm good I actually don't want you to join my party at all just to be a little stinker and yeah. then it's like come on dude come on oh but <laughs> I, I could really on. help and yeah. then it's like the same prompt it's like, yes, yes exactly uh, on, on that thread I, I I find it interesting that like anytime you talk to somebody, you can still move around as the text is is uh, like scrolling on the screen, which is felt like oddly like Half Life, where it's like, <laughs> oh yeah, this cutscene will play out, but you can just hop around the room and whatever, like break everything as people are talking about the end of the world. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's th that is among the many things. Like one of the reasons that this always stood out to me more than other RPGs, because I would get so frustrated by uh, random battles and stuff like that, mm -hmm. and like just being locked into dialogue sequences and stuff. Like that's one of the things that quickly stood out to me playing Chrono Trigger like, for the first time was like. Like, oh, the enemies are on. Like, even though it's still random battles, you know, like you're mm -hmm. still, it's ostensibly like functionally similar. Just being able to see them come at you on screen and being in control of the character while they're, there's dialogue and stuff like that yeah. just made the game so much more interesting and put me in so much more control. That and I and it just so being more. able to skip past some of them, too. Yeah, when, yeah. When you're going through the same areas multiple times. Yeah, that's yeah. Nice. I love that. Creator says, might not seem like a big deal now, but back then, having the battles take place right where you are in the world without dissolving to a different 
background blew my mind when I first played this. And honestly, it still feels good. Just the sound of a sword being unsheathed, followed by the incredible battle music to indicate you're starting a fight, always feels great. Yeah, and like totally. the enemies doing their little roar thing to like kick it off. Yeah, yeah. even uh, just the, the like the the sound of like I think when Chrono crits or whatever and he, you hear that extra second so slash I was like good. oh this is such a good midi sound the most satisfying yeah. crit in games yeah. I'll argue uh, Stephen Toth says after the fair when you go to the middle ages the blue imps you find are on the map and they just kind of attack you as a kid it blew my mind also a uh, quick shout out to the incredible Nintendo power guide for Chrono Trigger it's gorgeous and I read it so much as a kid the thing is yeah in that area I agree but it's weird to me that like that was definitely a thing that really stood out to me as well when I first played the game but in that area with like the blue imps in the forest like they're all kind of hidden it's like sometimes you have to go up and like trigger it where like it looks like what they're like in a log or like hidden then they'll come out and attack you and it's like it's really like when that's like such a defining feature that the first area you really encounter it they're trying to like hide it in a way i think it's cool because it it ties into that you know area thematically where it's like oh you're not aware of the entire area obviously it's a forest so your vision is clouded so like enemies are going to jump at you because you know they could be anywhere in the forest right whereas in the in the monastery later on everything's very apparent where everyone is right and you even run into some scenarios that build off the fact that you are in a house which is cool yeah yeah uh let's go back to the fair y'all uh peter fontana says so i don't know if anyone else felt this but it seems like this game expects you to draw your own conclusions a lot of the time I was initially confused by the lack of direction after meeting with Marl. Turns out the game really wanted you to just waste some time. There are a couple of other key points where I felt like the game didn't exactly tell me what to do. It's refreshing, but it took me off guard initially. I had that, we're wandering around with Marl, like, oh, I'm having a good time, but okay, how do I trigger this now? I've done enough of the side activities, and then it's like, oh, I needed yeah. to talk to the woman by the fountain in the yeah. middle. Yeah, yeah. I was I was stuck there, and I was like, oh my god, am I going to have to look up an <laughs> FAQ already, like this yeah. early? Because I had gone, and I had talked to everyone in the fair already and it seems like it they just want you once she's in your party to talk to a couple people but i had already talked to everyone so i kept on going back to the guards and they're like hey go spend some time at the fair and it's like there's nothing left to do at the fair i've done everything at the fair right i I think yeah that's definitely it feels like a a remnant from like that era where the expectation was that you would go and interact with literally everything in the environment and so why why guide you when you're going to do that thing Mm -hmm. anyway right so i think nowadays because they're you know a town like that would be would be so much more crowded and have so many more things going on that they would say like okay if you want to continue go down this path right Right. i did you do cross the line though where like it will start text will pop up and be like hey go check out that device go check out Mm. that device i'm still doing some stuff and be like no i think you want to check out the device and it's also like there's that one booth also where it's like here's this mystic like you go into this weird i don't know i don't want to call it other world yeah the haunted house and it's like this feels like do are people do people know that this is here because this is like kind of weird in a way that the rest of this fair is totally not i know the monsters are involved in this world but like having just this freaky floating hand thing doing the kefka laugh like coming towards you it's like Mm -hmm. what the hell oh uh, yeah you can trade in your points here <laughs> if you want to gamble oh okay that's totally fine well job well done it's been a hard day of work i gotta go back to my free yeah. house yeah. Just, <laughs> let me just go back to hell real quick and <laughs> joseph betts says finally after amassing hundreds of silver points i tackled the three mini games in the haunted house only to fail them causing <laughs> me to go out and earn hundreds more so i could retry them over and over again <laughs> although the fair activities are completely unnecessary towards the main story it adds a lot to the world building uh, and Adam Walker about that says, I'm less than 30 minutes in, and I already see a Star Wars reference. I go into the Tent of Horrors and choose to spend 10 silver points. I'm presented, presented with three knights named Wedge, Biggs, and Piet. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, Biggs and Wedge are an old Final Fantasy thing that they carry over in a tr- Chrono Trigger. Uh, and he's like, well, obviously, Biggs and Wedge from Star Wars. He also says, um, for Serial... Biggs, Darklighter, and Wedge Antilles were rebel pilots in the original trilogy. Uh, well, see, that's that's a, a reference I get now, having watched the <laughs> Star Wars movies. Recently. You watched them? Yeah. What do you think? I like them better than movies. Yeah. What's <laughs> the well, best one? Uh, Last Jedi is still, but Empire Strikes Back is oh. like a legitimately great movie. I love that oh, movie. Yeah, for sure. um, and he says he couldn't figure out what Piet was from. And he said, guess what? In the middle of writing this comment, I googled Piet Star Wars, and Admiral Piet was an Imperial officer. Bam. Mystery right. solved. There you go. Uh, I only did that once, like the 10 silver points one. I'm like, all right, I found Piet. I feel good. I don't need to mm-hmm. keep spending money in this freak show. Yeah. Did uh, you guys go dance and stuff like that? I didn't dance. On the uh, iPhone, mm. it actually. Oh, oh, I guess I did on the on the BC stage. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Is, is there anything to that? 
No. That you're supposed to. Well, well, no. It kind of. <laughs> no, not Why at all. Why would you ask? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, it's on the iPhone version. It just like when it's time to dance, it just throws up four colored squares on the screen that you can press to choose oh, really? the dances, which was weird. I would. Did... I, I never noticed that Marl and Chrono like really like are actively slapping their butts in like one of the dances. It's like that's at least thirty percent of what Marl does in this game is slap <laughs> yeah. her butt. Do you notice that for her lure move? Oh, yeah. have you used that I yet? Used like that. she no, just slaps it. her ass. <laughs> it's like okay, okay. 90s. <laughs> okay, 90s. Um, but yeah, every time Only I go in that area in the fair, I'm just reminded of the music, like the prehistoric music. It's like it was a stupid meme on YTMD for this guy named Brian Peppers. It's a long old meme, mm-hmm. but like I can't hear that music and not just think about this stupid old YTMD meme. Anyways, but, but in that area, yeah. there's not anything to do other than you can just dance. Yeah, yeah. For, I think most of it's that a stuff fun, is for fun. It's a fun nod. Okay, you yeah. can probably figure out where it's going. But uh, Miriam and Brenton says, you should really get an extra point on the bell strike if you do it in time with the men going, ha, during the fairgrounds <laughs> theme music. <laughs> See, Miriam and Brenton, you get you specificity, go. baby. Did you guys do the, the sodas, too? Like drink I did the, the sodas, and I did the, yeah, the, the strong men. Was it thing. difficult to drink the sodas? It was surprising. Like, I got to eight, and then, like, just as the, as the game ended. Okay. So it, it definitely felt like, oh, okay. I, it, I, well, Ross yeah. Winyard here says, screw the drinking game at the fair. More than seven jars is impossible, right? That's the thing. I, I saw people saying that, but, like, I don't know if it was, like, an iPhone thing, but it was, like, super easy to yeah. just tap the screen. I don't know. Oh, it was super easy they, on Steam. But I don't know if it scaled up. Maybe I just did the first yeah, one or something. Know. I wonder if they just made it easier in later versions. Yeah. If maybe. like the original Super Nintendo was like super hard and then they just kept making it easier. Yeah. yeah. The um you know what I appreciated? Because this game's so friendly and Chrono Trigger. I just like Chrono Trigger. <laughs> but um I love that it's such a good sign for like Luca and Chrono's friendship when they go up there and Luca's like, Hey Chrono, jump on this new device and then he's like, Alright, like no hesitation, <laughs> just immediately and she's like, You can keep going back and forth if you want. Okay. I, mean, I trust you with time travel, I guess. Yeah, I haven't seen the it. fly, so this yeah. seems pretty cool. And then Marl disappears and everyone's like, Okay, everyone get out. And everyone's like, Well, I guess that's how that ends. Over. Yep. <laughs> did, uh, I guess it's that attraction. This yeah. jumps ahead a little bit, but did you guys go to Luca's house? Uh no. like you can go there and uh you find Luca's mom, and she's looking out the window, and she says that her husband and daughter are always gone, tinkering <laughs> with inventions, and it's really sad. And then uh, Taban, her dad, yeah. walks in, and he gives her an apple, and he says, I got you an apple with what we earned. And then he walks out, and you go talk to her again, and she's like, that was thoughtful. Oh, and that's was so like, sweet. <laughs> but it, it was kind of like, it was like weird. It, it was sweet, but it was also kind of sad, because she's just looking out the window, like missing her husband and child, <laughs> and, and he's like, hey, I got you an apple. See ya. And she's like, oh. <laughs> I love him. You uh, know? Jason Esty loved that moment too. Um, did you guys go find the mayor? Yes, I have. Yeah. Okay, I have so John about him too. Jonathan yeah. Quavito writes and he says, "I only got to start tonight because of a big fighting game tournament." All right, cool guy. <laughs> but the only thing I want to bring up is that if you go to the mayor's mansion in Poyer, 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 at the beginning, he says uh, he has a kid that says, "Dad loves money more than he loves me." And then you can go up to the mayor and you can cluck like a chicken for 10 gold. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and there's a piano playing monster named Joe in the tavern named Snail Stop. Yeah. Snail and then kid. the, uh, yeah, all the kids in that house are bummed about their dad. And uh, the wife says, uh, our children are slipping away from us. It's so painful to see. <laughs> oh like, there's God. all these moments that, are, like, maybe I missed in the past, but of just yeah. like that talking to Luca's mom and like finding the mayor's wife, where it's just like, there's some. Sad people. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's right a, like the NPCs are this weird mix of like, oh, here's this hint towards the larger story and like one sentence tragedy. <laughs> yes. like, yeah, totally. And you walk up to someone and it's like, you know, Baby children's shoes, shoes never worn. Yeah, never worn. <laughs> 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 Maybe they'll be worn in the future. Yeah. Find out. <laughs> then you go find the baby who shoes those were. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. Maybe it's just because we're all old now, but yeah, every. Line of dialogue is sad. Yes. <laughs> um, Jason M. O'Brien wants to talk about Luca saying, um, I'm relying on MinMax to help call those sparks of magic from the community to help me finally fall in love with this game because mm. he's skeptical out of the sure, gate. Sure, sure. Fair. Which is fair. I like that. It's millennial fair. Uh, to help do my part, one interesting piece of dialogue from Luca is she just finished demonstrating her hyperdimensional transport using Chrono. Marl approaches and speaks with Chrono, and Luca says, Chrono, when did you manage to pick up a cutie like her? For me, this opened up sexuality and gender musings regarding Luca. Sure. Luca, Luca just loves robots and only machinery. I'm sorry. <laughs> do you guys like Luca as a character? I want to like her more than I do, I think. She has a tough competition in this game. Yeah, I mean, she just doesn't... I guess we can check back on this later, but certainly as an opening part, she doesn't do anything that like really defines her character and like 
big what ways mean? to me. She fixes robot. She's the reason this She's entire thing lady. happens. Yeah. She she makes the time machine. But I mean, I mean, her personality. I guess mm-hmm. is what I'm saying. There's nothing about her personality that stands out to She's, me. She she does know? machines. <laughs> oh, she's done tell. Oh, okay. Uh, whereas Marl. Marl is at least like you know kind of fun. Yeah, fun, and then also people talk about her and you know about, her. but like yeah, Luca's Luca's a little flat at least early on, you know. Yeah, I, I'm thinking like, well, do I just stick with my favorite characters for this run, or do I try and go for some underdogs, which I normally do? And I think in the entire crew, I think Luca's the biggest underdog, I believe. Although, should point out point out that. Uh, uh, Felix Nicholas says, "Hey Ben and the CTCs, uh, mm-hmm. that's computer loving cohorts." Mm-hmm. And I think he messed CLCs. it up. Yeah. Well, everybody makes mistakes. He says, "I would like to take a moment to appreciate the flamethrower attack ability. I have no idea how or why, but the flamethrower proved to be my most reliable tactic in the past section and the future area as well." So that's a Luca joint. It's good. Right? Hey, it good. Um, let's see. Going to the past, Eric Smith says, quote, nom, nom, nom. Talking to the guard who looked like he was attacked in the kitchen of the old castle was a good video game prank that I fell for. You go up to him, and he says, I'm dying of hunger. (laughs) (laughs) Well, because he's also, like, splayed out, um, and it looks like something's wrong, and he's like, I'm just so hungry, and then someone comes to deliver food, and he's like, hey, it's time to eat. Yeah, that entire kitchen sequence is, like, one of the most charming little sections of the game, and it seems completely optional, Yeah, it's it's weird that, like, it feels like a side quest about to happen when, you know, the the guards come in, and it's like, oh, this chef thinks he's so, like, important, and we're out there fighting, and the guy's like, these soldiers don't know what I do, and and then that's (laughs) it. Like, that's, like, the whole plot line. It's like, oh, it's weird that I, like, you have the option to uncover it and that it goes nowhere but it's like again one of the like the largest skill like little touches that they kind of mm-hmm. throw in there but I, I don't know if it maybe later on it's like oh yeah this entire yeah. this whole exchange was crucial to time or whatever mm-hmm. yeah it's it all hinges on that interaction in the I don't kitchen. know I don't know I've never finished right, this no, game <laughs> Joe, that the chef yeah it's Lavos <laughs> uh, he's cooking with lava <laughs> <laughs> Joseph Betts says, when visiting the castle in the past, you can go to the kitchen and order a meal. I thought it was funny that upon being served, Chrono's running anim- animation would play to communicate to the player that he was eating the food. Mm-hmm. These reuses of animations made me realize how I take for granted such detailed animation in games today. Yeah, that was funny. Yeah, uh, that was tr- back when, you know, if you wanted to say that a character was actually moving, you'd just have them do like a dance. And so everyone, as you walked around, was just like doing these weird like uh, shuffles. Yeah. So that's, that's, those were video games back then. Travis know. Morgan says, my first time playing through Corona Trigger, uh, he drove all around North Texas looking for a DS copy, eventually got oh, it. Oh, wow. I uh, might not finish in time for the section, but I do love that whenever Chrono goes through doors, the sound and the speed at which he does it makes me think he's just kicking them open as he goes. I don't know if that's actually what's going on, but he's well, like just Leon Kennedying his way through doors. Yeah, uh, um, he's in a hurry, man. Times of you know, times money or something. No doubt. Uh, oh, also Dominic Sachoki says I love the way that Chrono helplessly waves his arms while idling on the world map. It's so stupid. I love it. <laughs> um, I agree. Grizzled Gaming says, Chrono Trigger is one of the, my favorite games of all time, and I'm glad it still holds up to this day, except for one thing. Can we talk about how terrible Chrono's 2D sprites are in the overworld? The first time Chrono appeared in the overworld, I audibly went, ew. <laughs> and my son says, wow, he looks terrible. Uh, yeah, yeah. It might just be the Super Nintendo version, so here's hoping they get a sprite update. No, it's just they nope. got to pack a lot of art into a very yeah. small space. You know? I do. Uh, on the topic of that overworld, by the way, I love that like you don't get attacked out there. That's like, It huge. makes me so much more eager to explore. Yes. More. Like I found that there's that bridge that you can find. I think it's like the Zatan Bridge. Um, and there's like you can find it. There's like ten or fifteen people like walking to the fair that you can talk to, and it like it just made me so much more eager to walk around and see what was out there. Like in mm-hmm. the, where in like Final Fantasy, I'm like uh, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to get cut. Uh, Mom, I want to stay in bed. <laughs> uh, Someone else can save the world. Miriam and Brenton uh, says it's funny that Frog hops when he's traveling with you, but walks in the overworld map. <laughs> also, I love one of my favorite animations in the game is Frog's flex. It's mm-hmm. yeah, so good. Which it's so I love his hopping animation. The flex is good, but like Uh-oh. it looks like Earthworm Jim's arm. Which is like a weird thing. Maybe it's just because I played a lot. It's just of, called good art. It's I, I mean I played a lot of Earthworm Jim before I ever played Chrono Trigger, and uh-huh. it's like the same like cause Earthworm Jim has a big muscly white arm with a blue glove. Right. And like when I played it for the first time when I was young, I even was like, is that a reference to Earthworm Jim? <laughs> like I, I, I I'd love to hear if any commenters also see Earthworm Jim's arm when he flexes, because yeah. it might just be me. Now don't be mistaken. When he uses his slurp healing ability, his tongue that's his tongue, not a worm. Okay. Yeah. It's gotcha. not Earthworm Jim. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's not Dan yeah. Castellaneta voicing his tongue. No. <laughs> 
Uh, Eric Reed says, frog heals with slurp. That's gross. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Hey, man, don't knock it till you tried it. And also, we've established it's Earthworm Jim, so it's less gross. That's it's right. also weird that he uses that same tongue to, like, lure people in there and attack them, because then wouldn't that heal them? Is that right. how, What are the properties well, of Well, he uses the underside of his tongue. It's a very mm. complex maneuver. I'll so show it's you like later. A, it's like a uh, poison antidote kind of thing, where it's like, depending on how he licks you, it's like different... <laughs> uh, is that <laughs> yeah? Is that a so bottom side is bad. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. he has a hell of a time with lollipops. Um, mm. uh, Mark Ramirez just had a very correct statement saying Frog is the best. Yeah, Frog's the man. Like, <laughs> am I am I, am I unhealthily in love with Frog? Yes. Frog is like my favorite by a mile. Okay, but do you? Does he spend more than like ten minutes with you? Do you, do you recruit him Based back into your party on the or something? Ten minutes that we experienced <laughs> with him at this point. Um, who can say? Okay. There's no way of knowing, unfortunately. There's no way of knowing. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, Merriam and Brenton it's says... Weird that they put him on the box right then. <laughs> <laughs> Merriam and Brenton says, When Frog storms out of the castle after saying that he failed the queen, I really appreciated the touch that you can hear the door slam shut behind him. That's Kicks fun. his way out of the door. <laughs> also, just anytime <laughs> Frog's theme comes on, it's like, hell yeah. Like, he's such a good... Simple character, like we it's get rare. it. You love I the love frog. frog. I love frog, <laughs> but it's just rare to have a character that's just like so pure of heart, trying so hard to like be a noble character, but still compelling. I'm just putting it together in my mind now. It's because he's a frog, probably. <laughs> <laughs> if he was just a knight, I don't think I would really care too much about him. You wouldn't. Yeah, you wouldn't. I like think that frog is a frog. Uh, uh. Also, somebody I forget who was wrote in. They were describing things, and they said, "And then that frog guy, like, just <laughs> say frog. His name is just frog." <laughs> but Joe Juba oh. writes in again. He says, "I'm most familiar with the Super Nintendo version of this game, but I'm playing it on DS right now." Well, I like most of the changes. Having a clean, uncluttered battle screen is great. Yeah. Some nice. of the retranslated dialogue, though, is bugging me. Specifically, Frog's more conversational line delivery. I know it's not in line with the original Japanese, but I thought this Renaissance Fair style speech in the old version reinforced his commitment to chivalry and honor. Plus, it helped set him apart as a unique hero of his age. Now he just seems to talk like a regular dude, except he's a frog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hmm. I guess I'm usually thankful in RPGs when they don't have the Shakespearean. Yeah, it's like, okay, that. I've had enough of this evilese. Um, but. I could see missing that. A couple other people actually wrote in with that yeah. same complaint that they like the, the old-fashioned speak that he used to have. Yeah, like that time he says, sup, y'all, I'm frog. <laughs> no, he says, slurp, yeah. y'all. <laughs> slurp, y'all. <laughs> I'm uh, the frog guy. <laughs> I'm that frog guy. Sutton <laughs> writes in, again, with the level of specificity that I love. I want to slurp Sutton here. <laughs> With the uh, top side of the tongue or the bottom? Side? Well, let's find out. Uh, Sutton says, I like the human bridge made by the Chancellor and his goons after the tank battle. <laughs> Remember, mm, this yeah. is very good little yeah. I also of think, like, um, that bridge sequence is a really good showcase for why I think I like the, the presentation of the combat system. The fact that they can if sh have that shift in perspective, have a fight there, and have it feel consistent with the yes, times you were inside like yep. is, like, a really strong testament to how much work they must have put into, like, the even the perspective of that game. Yeah. Just to make it work that way. Yeah. Carlos says, hello, Min Maxers. The boss battles are so well done. Something as simple as the dragon tank, where you can take out the head to stop the healing and wheels to stop its charge attack. It's nice there's a note in the room beforehand that gives you some hints. It is funny. We're like, it's invincible! Unless you have like a sword yeah. and bit touch its head. <laughs> yeah, I would have, I I, I, under, I I like that it's there, but I think I, I would have liked maybe that fight a little bit more if it wasn't completely telegraphed of like, oh, it just hit the head. Because even, even right. I think you could go that game without that note even, because it, it just says, like, there's a note when he does that where it says, head heals the rest of the body. So it's yep. like, that's your clue to like attack the head. Yeah. Right. But the fact that they're so obvious about it is, is you know. yeah. There, uh, there are so many moments in that in the prison that are like way funnier than I remember. Like, that's like the big thing for me is like the the humor and the tone is like so funny in there and the like guys this, dying in their prison cells. Well, there's that. there's that one guy that like this this like big uh, knight comes and starts fighting you and you make progress on him and he just runs out saying they don't pay me enough for this, which is <laughs> like I love that like and yeah. then and then the bridge and stuff like like that I I love those moments like those like like I said it was it's funnier than I remember that whole sequence being, yeah which really is good for what happens next which we'll get to soon, right you know? right but even like. I forgot about like Chrono like knocking out the guards. Yeah, that was weird. And then like also he has his sword. Like they just let him keep all his <laughs> equipment. They I don't. Guess. I mean, his sword could be entirely metaphorical though. How little they talk about the fact that I'm a kid who just happens to have this sword with me at, at all times. I've don't mastered it. it. Don't. Yeah. I can do this weird spin move. Oh, by the way, Ryan McCormick, uh, he loves Dragon Tank boss fight, and he says when Chrono plunges his sword into the tank to finally destroy it, it's one of the most iconic images of the game to me. Yeah, that is sweet. Which, by the way, is in the opening cinematic. The anime version, mm -hmm. if you're if you're playing on anything other than the Super Nintendo, right? 
And so in my mind, I thought like, well, surely like these cutscenes are going to be in those sequences. Like, oh, oh yeah, during no, like the no. bridge stuff, we'll see that animated sequence there. But it's like, no, it turns out it's just like a montage in the beginning, which I didn't expect. So yeah, I haven't hit weird. a cutscene yet. Yeah, I've, I've, yeah. I hit one, like the, the Robo one, where you really? initially find Robo, yeah. Did you? There's all these rats and things think, around the so, corner. Yeah, because I'm also maybe it's the DS version. The DS version definitely has the cutscenes. Uh, what maybe the Steam does version does it? Like the iOS and Steam? That's that terrible. The <laughs> I want to see those things. Have you never seen it before? Wait, like in it, context? No, I don't think it's, so. It's yeah. when you wa- run into the room where Robo is. It's super short. Yeah, it's like pretty short. It's like maybe thirty. God, I maybe can't be- imagine I would have glossed yeah. past that. I don't think so. Huh? Weird. weird. The prison stuff is also weird. Like when you're. This is probably the jankiest part of the game so far. When you're on like the prison walls outside, you can mm-hmm. go up and down. Like you get a steel sword if you go all the way down, so it's worth it. But like navigating that was like there's no any indication that like you can climb here. It's mm-hmm. just like this. Yeah, it's uncomfortable. Funky. Bit after that, I was like, are, are, Have there been other walls I can climb? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so, by the way. Yeah, I, I mean, they telegraph that it. by by having the um, the the hole in the wall that you can't get it in, in the cell that you can't get into, and then later on, you find the mm-hmm. other one that you can. So it's like right. it feels pretty limited to that one instance. Yeah, uh, okay, let's get to what everybody wanted to talk about the fact that there's no H in his name. Yeah. No. Uh, Travis wrote in saying, I love during the trial portion of the game, there are so many different factors that decide your verdict. The dialogue is hilarious when you get the not guilty verdict, and yet the escorting guard insists on an execution. The guard behind the table is like, uh, what execution? I believe that was pretty revolutionary in games during the mid-90s. I was blown away as a young lad. Yeah. P.S. Me and my friends nearly died laughing once you escaped to the future, and the chancellor's mouth is in full-on sprite jaw-drop <laughs> mode. Yeah, we yeah. left it pause for what seemed like hours laughing at it. Uh, yeah, that the trial is like still probably one of my favorite moments in the game. You know, yeah. like it blew my mind when I was young that it was like all those things that I just wasn't even thinking about earlier, just mm-hmm. doing things like that is all a factor here. Like I couldn't believe it. It was really thrilling. Like it, yeah. was, it was really awesome. Yeah, they they totally got me with it too. Yep. Uh, going into it, and I the little girl came out and said that I saved her cat, and that was good. And How then, do you save the cat? You just have to go find it. Okay. I it's, did. It's like two screens over. I did, and then, but then you click on it, and it just runs away, right? Yeah, or it just like disappeared, and then I went I back think, to the girl. And I like, think if I click, you you click on it once, and then you kind of lead it around. Okay. Oh, There's, is that what that's, it is? Yeah, that's I couldn't figure it out. But if you do case. it twice, it runs away. Oh, hang if on, you, real quick, we'll get back to your thought, mm-hmm. Jeff. But Mr. Hipshot says, um, "Did the little girl who's looking for her cat testify against me because it didn't help her? I tried. I saw a cat running around in that race at the fair and I tried grabbing it, but nothing happened. I went back to talk to the girl. She said the same thing she did before, so I gave up. Was it a different cat? I tried. <laughs> it was a different cat, yes. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. It's not the one in the race. No, no, no. Not the race. It's the one two screens over to the left. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's that one. I think he, he mentioned the race. It There's a cat running around the I see, race. I see. Yes, it is, it is a different cat, and she does testify for you, but then the chancellor comes out, and it was such a perfect moment because he's like, have you ever stolen? And it's like, oh, f***. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and I owned up to it, but that, like, didn't help me at all. It was yeah. it the old man's lunch? Yeah, it was, yeah, it was the old man's lunch, and then he came out and testified against me because he had said... And he said it before, like right before I ate his stupid lunch about how like his wife is so thoughtful and made him this whole meal. And he basically gave the same spiel again. And I and they ended up finding me guilty because of I guess because of that. It was yeah. like a very split thing. But the I guess like the good the good part of it is like I stole that dude's lunch like ten times because <laughs> because it keeps on replenishing. And I didn't know how to get through that fair part, so I kept on fighting the robot and then right. going back and eating uh. it. So I was like, well, at least they're only counted once against me. But somebody wrote in. I'm sorry. I didn't include it here, but I included other messages from them. But they wrote in saying like it seems unfair because it seems like the trial is like punishing you for experimenting and playing around in the fair. I, I suppose, but yeah, just the just having my actions play out later in like such a specific narrative way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, was, it was worth it. To, like I didn't mind being punished just because I was like, this is so cool. Yeah. yeah. You know? I feel my trial was pretty minimal and it was just like the, the, the girl coming out, hey you saved my cat and then like it me immediately shifted to uh you ran into her you led her along and I was like, what did you is I mean like and then you were like did you do this? And I was like, I don't think so. And then they play the cutscene where you run into them. And even then, I was like, 
yeah, I don't think I I didn't do that. Like <laughs> I wouldn't say that I led her along or whatever. Yeah. There's also uh, an opportunity to sell her necklace. I think that you I can, did that. Oh, yeah. I didn't sell yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, I tried to sell it. Yeah. Um, and didn't even think that was the most specific thing. I was like, oh my god, I can't believe they got me on that. Russell Christian said uh, the trial is definitely a teaching aid to let you know that your actions will change how the game plays out, with a possible 13 endings. So mm. keep that in mind. Um, but Danielle Van Pelt, thanks for writing in. Danielle says, other than knowing uh, that Chrono Trigger was sort of kind of about time travel, I knew absolutely nothing else about the game. A specific detail that blew my mind for games of this era was the trial. I had so many emotions running through my mind during it. First off, I was so mad at that little girl. I swear <laughs> she never asked me to look for a cat, even though I tried talking to her. Then uh, there was the lunch. Square came in swinging, but not even prompting me. As most video gamers would, I tried interacting with an out-of-place item, and finally I tried not asking to sell her pendant. But when I tried once again, he once he asked again. If I would have said no the second time, I would have been able to leave the store? Overall, I just loved how they tied in your actions for an event that happened a few hours earlier, especially back then. Something like this happens in a modern game would still grind my gears, but I find this was way ahead of its time. Oh, and to continue to the breakout afterward, I didn't know until looking at a guide after the fact that you could have literally just waited the days out in the prison cell. Oh, really? Yeah, oh, I didn't, didn't have that. to bust out. Right. My video gaming mind was like, okay, how do I break out of here? It's cool then to add the option just to wait. I think Luca comes and busts you out? Yeah. Okay. Like, well, I'm assuming. Oh, I, eventually. I, say, like, I know, but I think. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, it wasn't like a thing where you can just serve out your prison sentence. Apparently. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's one of the 13 endings. Oh, yeah. Okay. I think that's how it works. He, he was rehabilitated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The uh, I could have sworn they're like, okay, jurors that are saying he's not guilty, go to the right. Guilty, left. And I could have sworn there were more not guilty, and then I still got sentenced. I don't know exactly. Uh, I mean, you're going to go to prison no matter what, right? It doesn't matter. I think there's some way you can get. Not well, guilty there, yeah. The, well, you can, but the chancellor will still, like, he'll just go around the okay. law and maybe, he'll still go to prison. Maybe that is what happened to me then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Uh, Wayne D. says, I'm going to pick as my moment to talk about when you first arrive in the future. Up until this moment, the game has been serious, no doubt, but still has some joy in every moment. When you get here, you can tell things are bad. <laughs> the music has always stuck with me from this time, and you, it always gives me the chills when I hear it. Then you enter the dome. Please, give it its due. The banger dome. Um, <laughs> near the time gate you came out of. These people are dying. They're running out of options. The entire area, in my opinion, is perfect. Even down to the Innertron, which fully heals you and restores MP, but leaves you with, you're just as hungry as before. Still hungry. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that, that note stuck out to me, and it was like, oh my god. So, like, these people are just healing themselves, but they're still starving? What a that's, nightmare. That's such a weird detail to add. Yeah. And, yeah, it's just implied Doan and the other folks there. They're absolutely cannibals, right? Like, how else are they surviving? What are they doing? Licking steel for sustenance? I don't know. I no, really I, I, I just assumed like the um, the Enertron is is like keeping them alive and in a giving, state of torture. Is what right? I it's like, like oh. they will never die. Well, I mean, they'll be fine as long as they use the Enertron, but they'll just all, like hunger is just like a, a, a thing that they will always experience yeah. for oh whatever reason. Oh my god! I didn't even think of that. Yeah. But yeah. I, I, like that, that, it's such a really good um, tone shift. That kind of highlights like what happens, right? Because it yeah. at the at, it feels like the the early hours feel like the start of a you know oddly enough like a Simpsons episode where it's like it starts off at, at, as like oh the Simpsons are at the fair and then like over the course of the episode they stumble into like this other thing that becomes the major plot of the game, right? Mm. Sure. Uh, so this feels like that where it's like oh we're going on this other quest where you think it's all about rescuing uh, rescuing Marl, but then like in the course of that you stumble into something so much larger, which yes. I think is a really cool like uh, yeah. thing for an RPG to do, and it feels so dire of like oh. Like I thought things were like serious or whatever before when during the trial. This feels so much more dire. Yeah, and like having like the lightning crack on the world map and stuff. Like that's such a cool effect. Yeah. I mean we kind of, we glossed over it a little bit, but like the prison was so fun to me. And then also saving uh, Marl, saving the queen in the past. Yeah. That whole sequence is really funny too. Like where you you find the fake lean and she's like, oh I'm God, I don't want to be saved. And there's like you find that room where there's the the group of uh, monsters. And they're like, oh you don't have to wear your human costume in here. We're all good. And then you like find the chancellor in the chest yeah like yeah. all that stuff was so goofy and then yeah. the trial's pretty serious and the prison just felt funny and then it just everything just i feel like drops off this ledge of like and i loved it like i love that switch so much of mm -hmm. just like this is a horrifying place <laughs> right, yeah. right and, now and it also kind of reaffirms and like gives more weight to the mission that you're going on because yeah. it's you're you're yeah. always trying to save the world right but you never get to see like well this is the screwed up like this is the bad thing well, that Thomas you're trying to avoid. Is hello but move on well i i, I, think <laughs> I don't play these games <laughs> I, I, I do though i specifically appreciate that there is no like you know 
as much as this game is initially grounded in fantasy stuff, there that there isn't like, oh, well, I mean, not yet, but Chrono is the chosen one. Like, you've been deemed like that you have yeah. some special property that will allow you to save the world. Like, they they really just stumble onto this and they take it upon them, which, you know, Atlantis, as it might seem, like they see the world, oh, the world's going to end. Let's not tell anybody, but we can handle this. We'll, we'll save the world. We got this. Yeah. But, like, the fact that you are that you know the characters in your party have the agency and they're like no we're going to we're going to take this upon ourselves it's not a thing that's thrust thrust onto you it's not like hey the crystals will make sure that you know go around and do this yeah i, I like that sort of agency that the characters have and then the music kicks in and it's such a triumphant moment but it really was funny cuz i went back up to the computer after the triumphant main theme kicked in and then was able to rewatch the entire lavos coming out and destroying the world oh, thing yeah. While the music was still triumphant, <laughs> I was like, this is very jarring to watch. That, that sequence, though, is I think is really cool because they had yeah. they do like the weird camera cuts and like the, the glitchiness of the of like the the audit the video feed. I think that's yeah. like I did not expect them to be able to do that like on a uh, Super Nintendo. Right, like it was like, right. a, huh? I, I'm surprised they were able yeah. to pull off something like this. And it's, yeah. it's genuinely scary. Like, yeah. to see to see Lavos, you know. Also, that. it's kind of fun that it takes place in 1999. And this game mm-hmm. was released in 95, just like tying into a little bit of that like Y2K fear, yeah. even mm-hmm. though like timeline, it's such a confusing thing. Also, yeah, the future is horrifying, dark, uh, just like the haze over the screen when you're in the dungeons and mm-hmm. stuff too, which every time there's an enemy that did like a scanning move, it like deleted the haze. I don't know if that happened in the original version or for your guys' version, remember. but it's like this weird like jarring pop. But anyways, uh, two things incredibly messed up in this in the future. One is... Those rats that steal your potions can burn in hell. <laughs> I hate yeah, that yeah, yeah. so much. Oh, I mean, by, by that point, I had like 30 potions or whatever oh, stocked okay. up. And so I was like, oh, I thought it was like a neat thing. It's like, oh, cool. This rat just stole my potion. But I can totally see if you only had like five. You'd be like, I had screw like, you, rat. I'm floating around 14, okay. but I just don't care for it. And the other thing <laughs> is those mutant enemies that are like the weird, like elongated baby mm. turnip things with like the pink skin. I hate the look of those. Yeah. Like they freak me out. I wrote down, what is that sleepy looking monster with the weird hat? Like there's just like, everything is just weird and yeah. creepy. Well, know? hang on, are you talking about, did you go the distance and go to like Death Mountain? What is it called? Oh no, I don't think I did that. Okay, did you guys do that? No. Oh. So in, um, in the second area, after site 16 after you is it before or after the motorcycle race it's after the yes after the motorcycle race you can go up to this area where like death peak is and they're talking about like they made some reference to like oh there's an old man to the south something something he's crazy anyways i think we might be going back there later um so i won't dive into it now but yeah there's an old man there who's talking something about shala and he's like i built the blackbird i built the blackbird i don't know what this guy's talking about (laughs) i genuinely don't remember what that guy's talking about but i think he's important i think he built a blackbird i think he built a blackbird um yeah, everything's dark except for Johnny. Nothing dark and morbid about good old Johnny boy, huh? Yeah. Motorcycle guy? Yeah. I'm, that I'm was a mo- super that, who weird. is a, motor- <laughs> a literal motorcycle guy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which I, I think I read at one point that there's like uh, hackers, you know, or data miners or whatever you want to call them, like found like other sort of angles on him, like other uh, pixel art for him, mm-hmm. implying that maybe at one point he was going to be a party member. Uh, what? Yeah. Really? Cool. Yeah, and like, uh, but you know, he got cut, or they they made that that call really early on. But it kind of he's so o- overly designed that it does seem yeah. like he should be in your party, you know, or like should have. I just saw it as like something. kind of like a square tech test of like maybe, you know in this yeah. era there Mode was seven, maybe. Well, I yeah. just mean the character specifically. I know, yeah. I know, but yeah, uh, Justin Swartz. I was says, so worried about that sequence on the touchscreen, by the way. Yeah, and like it, it was, it was fine. I got through it fine, but I was like, I was like, I don't want to have to do this a million times. I, <laughs> I got through it like once, so I because it's the trick is just staying in front of them, you know. Right. I uh, kind of I know. People, well, anyways, Justin Swartz says I'm a first time Chrono Trigger player. I reached the jet bike race against Johnny in Lab 32, and wow, was that random and unexpected. Yeah, yeah, Random yeah. because why does he keep calling me babe? Unexpected because I certainly didn't see a racing racing mini game coming up. We'll ride the wind, babe, <laughs> says Johnny. <laughs> uh, I I remember dreading it, and then like getting to it, I was like, oh, I think it's kind of fun just to like keep bumping in front yeah. of him over and over again. But the first time you do it, like maybe that that first time you and I played it, I found it very frustrating. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, Did you guys get tr- have trouble with it? Like I, having never encountered. I think it I only had to do it a couple times, but it's it's not really a race either, just because you're both like rubber banded to each other. Yeah. So yeah. It ultimately, was just 
keep all of my boosts until the very end and then shoot past them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, basically, you, like, yeah, because you're so rubber banded together. Like, basically, all I, I realized that, oh, I, I only need to be in front of him at the right time. Yeah. yeah. So, like, it was pretty easy to just, like, basically keep bouncing off of him. So, I was, ba I basically mm -hmm. did that, like, half the race. And then yeah. I just, yeah, I. I Someone was just like, super. look, Mode Seven's here. We have to use it. We Nintendo will be mad if we don't use yeah. it. <laughs> Chris Bartlett says, why is Site 16 in the future section located right next to Site 32? Where are Sites 17 through 31? <gasps> They're dead. Don't you uh, get it, it? They they went off of bit technology, you know. It's 16, 32, oh. yeah, 64. <laughs> site 64, oh, yeah. Smart. The Site Station. <laughs> Uh, Shuffle Guy says, when you return with the seed in the future, after the, after the disastrous report on the supercomputer, the way people gather around you is something I have not seen happening in video games recently. It really makes the world feel more alive. Yeah, I love that sequence. I don't know if I was just in a weirdly emotional mood last night, but I was like, there's something so beautiful about, like, you don't find the food to help these people. Mm -hmm. You just get them one seed. Like, just like this glimmer of hope for these just <laughs> annihilated people. It's really nice. Yeah. Did you guys have trouble with that boss? Uh, who protects the, robot? the seed? I I found it like surprisingly difficult. The one with like the the probes that pop yeah, up. Yeah, like maybe I just wasn't leveled high enough or something. But it ended up taking me like two or three tries. Some you know? people did. Yeah, here Daniel uh, Dwiggin says I was really excited to hear that Chrono Trigger was on the docket for the next Deepest Dive. It's always been the game that I wanted to play. Thank you. That being said, it's one of the most stressful games I've ever played. <laughs> wow, I find okay. myself panicking during big busy fights, most notably against the Guardian in the Aristome. Yeah. And having a hard time dealing with the amount of quick attacks and information being thrown at me from every direction. It's a really unique combat system that I've never seen before, and I really hope I can get the hang of it as the game goes on. Well, is that I mean, Daniel? Dwiggins? There's Dwiggins. An, like, try turning, going to the uh, turn-based version. Like, turn off the active Yeah, version. Chris Carl is wondering if we're playing yeah. on active or wait. I saw somebody say that they went to wait, but that it wasn't waiting. Did it's, you guys? It's weird. It, yeah. it is weird. Yeah, I am playing on the wait version, and it seemed... I don't know how I don't know what kind of math they're doing in the background to figure out like when enemies can attack you because sometimes it does seem like they may still put in an attack but okay. then they won't kind of it's huh. it, I mean ultimately just like don't wait around too long after the bar yeah. fills up or whatever. It's much more intense than I remember. It is it is hectic and even playing on on Steam, yeah, I'm feeling the pressure and it's just like the Vakra or whatever, like the Chancellor monster guy. Like mm. that was one where I'm like, oh, okay, I have to take this game seriously. I forgot what it was like playing games in the nineties. Not <laughs> I haven't died yet, but it is just that moment of like, okay, I actually have to use some items here quite yeah. frequently. This isn't you know? the same Pokemon. It, exactly. Mm -hmm. Honestly, yeah. Or so many other modern uh, Do you yeah. have auto? Is it do you have like the auto battle option or is that an iOS thing? Uh yeah, that's on there. I'm not gonna yeah. do that. Though. I use that a little bit. Do you really? Just for like the piddly guys? Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Piddlies. Uh, I've been using the, the active stuff, and I've been I've definitely f I kind of like how active it is that you constantly have to think about it. I, the menus kind of run into like it collides with the menus a little bit, where you're like, oh, I I'm, I want to use the flamethrower spin attack, right? And so you go yeah. into the tech, and it's like, okay, there's an option that just says dual tech or whatever, and so like you ha the the amount of scrolling you have to do in those things yeah. kind of slows things down. For sure. Um, the other thing that is weird is that like they have this positional combat system where it's like, okay, if you if Chrono is near these three guys, he'll hit all. All of them with the spin attack but if yep. they're separated uh he won't obviously but it doesn't feel like you can really manipulate that beyond like waiting for them to do it so there's not it doesn't feel like there's a ton of strategy there like especially like in the boss fight where um you're fighting all those robots that are that attack robo mm. it just feels like well i just the fact that luca is up here means that she can hit these two but you know i'm gonna have to figure this these other ones out um and like i can't hit all three of them in a row totally like, it doesn't feel like you have much control over when aoe attacks can hit in an aoe besides waiting right, right? thomas says exactly that he says i feel like there were a few systems that didn't pan out mid-development but the bones were still left in the game. For example, in combat, your physical positions play into some of your attacks and what you can hit, but you have no control of where Chrono and the gang are standing in a fight. Yeah, I get it. I kind of like it where it's like, oh, if it happens to work out, that's fine. Yeah, that's, like, mm -hmm. that's sort of where it's like, a, oh, I, it, almost like another way of, of being able to do a critical attack. It's just like, oh, these guys happen to be in a position where I can take advantage of it versus like, okay, like there's that one enemy in the in the prisons where you have to wait for them for their shield to like, for them to drop their guard basically. Yeah. And that, that has been the only enemy that felt like, okay, I need, this is actually making use of the way this combat system works, whereas yeah. everything else just happens to be coincidental. I could really use a defend option, especially when they're like mm. counting down to big attacks and stuff it's like okay i guess i'll just hit you harder now Use I wish potions. I just... <laughs> yeah i guess yeah uh thomas also says another thing that feels shelled out 
but has left a part behind is the character's element assignment. Why is Chrono Lightning? How is Chrono Lightning? Unless there's some <laughs> Pokemon-like type advantages I haven't noticed. It doesn't seem to have a purpose. I didn't I even know they had affinities like that. If you go on the menu, you can see, yeah. So like How's that Marl's relevant? water. Um, For healing, I guess. Right. Yeah, the healing water, I guess, and Luca's oh. fire. So it's it's very loose, but I think there must be some elemental stuff because definitely it's a situation where like I'll use a fire attack and it won't do as much against robots, stuff it, like that. Yeah, yeah, and it's it seems like that's something they introduced in the end of time area, like right at the end of where we were playing. Oh, so I don't okay. know if that, oh. it will start building yeah. off of that. Yeah, but the, I didn't the, much. the creepy guy in the trench coat was like, "Hey, you can go practice elementals in there," and that oh, that was okay. the first time that it unlocked or like started telling me about it. So and I just thought, like, "Yeah, I'll just I'll level it. I'm good. Thanks." Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's also weird that yeah, the, you mentioned the end of time spot. It's such a weird compounding rabbit hole of like, okay, here's like there's a this post apocalypse. We thought that was crazy. Let's take you to like this abstract plane of existence <laughs> where it's just like I don't know if you travel enough, you'll eventually end up here because this is where people go and then like I love that though yeah. I love that yeah. sequence so much it's just so strange and just that guy explaining that like yeah we're just the point of least resistance for time so we're like when you're pushing the limits of time you will bounce back here yes. yeah and then as it's the Jeremy Baramy zone the, excuse me it's the Jeremy Baramy zone mm, Jeff yeah. you got my back on this no, no? no okay. one knows what the hell you're talking about <laughs> yeah I feel like it's, it's from, from the good there. place oh yeah. oh sorry uh, but then also god I wish I could remember uh, Hugo H2P Oh, I'm sorry, Eric Reed says, I love how the game has a story logic behind the three-character party limit with the end of time. Many games mm. never explain why you can only bring X number of people along. For sure. Yeah, yeah, I love that idea, for sure. And I still have yet to explore end of time. I really just talked to the guy a little bit and then yeah. saved yeah. it. Who did you guys leave behind? I didn't make that decision yet. Oh, I think oh. Uh, I think I did leave Luca behind because Marla Marl has the uh, healing. That's the exact decision. Even though I like Luca a lot, uh, yeah. I had to leave her behind because like Robo is like the big tanky. He's got a lot of HP. Marla can heal, and yeah. you can't not have Chrono on the team, yeah. or as I like to call him, Chronic, which is what I named him <laughs> <laughs> without an Dumb. H. Yeah, no H. So did you guys go to the? I think it's the Proto Dome to get the password to go fight. The the, mm -hmm. the yeah because like, like the button sequence you have to press yeah so like I was really dreading the proto dome because I I don't like that area yeah. and is like, that the one with the conveyor belts yeah like yeah, yeah. That, anytime you see conveyor belts like oh god no and I and I didn't and I it I basically was able to pretty easily guess my way into fight that boss which mm. I didn't think you could do because the password's just like four colors and it like it, well, it gives you they, like the, infinite the, tries the, 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 the name of the of uh, the door, I think, or whatever system is used to lock it, is called Zabby, and that's like yeah. the exact combination of yeah. the input. So I was like, I was really happy about that. I uh, ultimately, lo like, when I realized the end of time was right around the corner, I went back and went to the Proto Dome just to try to like, well, I should, I should go through here just to level up yeah, properly. Yeah. But I was like, I was happy to have bypassed it because like that was like one of, that was like that's one of the weaker moments in the game to me is like dealing with those conveyor belts and yeah. trying to make your way through well, that Patrick section. Well, Patrick Polk says, yeah, uh, saying Front Trigger is one of my favorite games of all time, but I've forgotten how visually confusing some of it can be. I had a really hard time figuring out which barriers I could walk in the future section, for instance. I couldn't mm -hmm. distinguish chests and the ruins very well at all. Worst of all, it took me a long time to figure out how to get out of the conveyor belt room in the factory as well because I didn't realize there was a door in the lower left when you get off the belt. I had that exact situation mm -hmm. where it's like, where do I exit? Like, I need the Final Fantasy VII, like, mm -hmm. little red indicator. Yeah, mm -hmm. I definitely found the note that tells you, like, here are the two button combos that like will move the the crane after I just like okay well I press the I basically brute forced it where I was like I press yeah. two buttons and that's wrong press these two that's wrong okay these two I guess made the good noise yeah. so that's what I, I did I to, just move on to get to yeah. that boss yeah. I I totally didn't understand that either and was like well I want I want the crane to go down and then to the right because that's where the barrel is and I was pressing them and I lucked into one of them and then I couldn't figure out the mm -hmm. other one I was like okay now is the FAQ time I kept on waiting <laughs> yeah. to figure out like. What the hell? But I, it turned out I just hadn't explored, explored that yeah. one area, and that's right. yeah. that seems to kind of be like that old school design of like you really have to just yeah. be willing to go around and talk to everyone. It looked more confusing than it actually is. Like seeing the conveyor belt, I honestly I still don't know what the barrels were. It's like I don't know. I hit that's the crane the thing and did a thing. Like yeah. I didn't really understand how I blasted through that area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that area was just frustrating because. If you do get caught, you have to go through like four different battles, and it's yeah, just a very drawn out process. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. I wouldn't have minded if it was, you know, one big battle that was four times as tough or whatever. It's just <laughs> it's the sitting through each one that, oh, yeah, kind see, of I, made I, it I didn't even understand that that was a failure state. I just thought that was what you had to do. Like, I yeah. just went through those four fights, and it was at the end of the conveyor. So, I was like, I think this is where I'm supposed to go. Yeah. I think just to 
and I, we, I could be proven wrong, but I don't think there's any other points in the game like that that I that I remember finding frustrating. No more conveying. You promise. No more conveying your belts. I promise. But yeah, like there's no other. I don't think there's even any like crazy puzzles like that necessarily. I guess we'll find out as we play along. But yeah, like that's the remember. only one that I rem- like thinking back on that I'm like I don't like this area. But also it's know? in the early parts of the game, so you probably yes, experienced it more. That's true so. too. Yeah. Uh, Justin Swartz says, "Hey Ben and the CLCs, I'm a first time Chrono Trigger player and playing on the Super Nintendo. Hey Justin, mm, right? Nice. Several people are playing on Super Nintendo. Very cool. Yeah, that's cool." Uh, I was fortunate to notice a treasure chest in Lab 16 because it contained the load bow, which raised Marl's weapon stat by 11. This dark blue chest really blends in with the dark blue environment and provided a really helpful reward. Uh, it sure seemed easy to miss. Yeah, I, I found a silver sword there, too, that was, like, really hard to miss. But I had actually bought a silver sword at the Millennial, Millennial Fair, which was, like, really expensive. Yeah, yeah. To the point where I was like... Should I have this this early? And then like, then when I got another one, I was like, I, I, it just reiterated to me. I was like, I don't know if I was, I don't know if they really expected anyone to actually save up and buy that thing that early in it's the game. It's cool though that they put that in I, there. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's see, Dan, Willie. Well, no, let's stick with. <laughs> Sorry, oh Dan. yes, here we go. Zachary Sweet says my favorite part of the game so far has been the sewer section, where the game tells you to be quiet via a written note. Despite this, I not only ran into the cat, but was also fooled into thinking that the save icon was real and had to fight another round of enemies after it made the save mm. sound. Uh, Faldon Bear says his favorite moment was the fake save point in that sewer system. Wait, what? Is, Where was this? Where you're I think ch- it's chasing optional. the rat? Um, no, not when you're chasing the rat. So it's in the lower right of... Oh, like you you don't have to go the there to is finish it. it. And you go underground. Era is this? The future. Uh, the future. Okay. And you're sort of exploring sewers, and there's, like, cans and things. They warn you that the sewers are dangerous, and you go down there, and then, yeah, you, like, reconnect bridges. There's, like, two talking frogs that don't look oh, at all I, like yeah, frog. I, I didn't do this at all. Oh, really? There's yeah. a lot of fighting. Everyone's, like, playing tricks on you down there and stuff, but... Uh, I guess you get some decent items. I'm trying to remember. Yeah, there's not, I mean, there wasn't a huge reason to go down there yeah. uh, but like yeah the, the, you the, fight a boss the fun thing is like there's like these cans and you can like walk up to them and like you know interact with them and chrono kicks them and that makes noise so like enemies attack you oh. and what and what the uh people who wrote in are describing is like there's a save point that you go and, and you try to go save at and it makes a loud noise yeah and then enemies will attack you and it's not actually a save point oh, like it's right. just it's just kind of cool. yeah goofy and yeah kind of mm. should play with your there. expectations yeah 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 uh Eric Smith says, Marl complains about Robo's serial number being R66Y, not being an appropriate name. It makes you choose one. If you type R66Y, she says, it's perfect and it's a great idea. (laughs) What an idiot. (laughs) That's hilarious. Do you guys think, I don't know if Eric's going here directly, but how much of a bimbo do you think Marl is? Like, I'm glad that it's not, like, obnoxious in that trope, but it's like, oh, she's playful, and, like, I like her, even if she is a little bit silly, and she's like, that's so stupid every once in a while. I don't don't, I I I wouldn't think of her as an airhead. It just seems like she's just the tomboy. I think they're flirting with that, don't, aren't they? I know. I didn't really take that away. Not so so far. There was some time in the future where she's like, what does this button do? Like, she had one of those, like, types of little moments. Oh, yeah, like, like, yeah, there's a moment in the facility where you do that. Speaking of the facility, uh, the noise that the computer makes when you're typing it in, I found, like, really... No, no, no! Like the the clicking, like when it makes. Okay. Those, I thought like a that was part of the song that's that was gonna stick around for a while, <laughs> and also it felt like my DS was breaking because it oh, no. like the the way it was crackling was like is something wrong with my console? Because it <laughs> feels I don't know like the the loudness of that one noise feels really weird. It's a Kojima esque screw with yeah. the play. Oh moment. what? <laughs> Chris Carl. I have to swap, in, it was swap inputs on my 3DS. <laughs> <laughs> I have to hold it upside down. <laughs> Chris Carl says, The intro to Chrono Trigger overall was wild. Ridiculously goofy sounding seagulls and balloons that sounded like they were being shot at a cannons. <laughs> yeah, Two man. minutes in and I can't wait to hear the rest of the game's sound effects. What sound effects stick out to you? So that's your choice then, Serial. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Yeah. For me, it's like, in the future section, 16-bit wind makes me laugh. It's just like loud screeching <laughs> it's just like oh well, i definitely notice it's windy game just yeah. relax a little bit cool it um so trial number one talker second biggest talker is what Mary and brenton are getting to here saying not growing up with a sprite based game or playing many of them i never thought that the visual style or limited animation could convey an emotional story for someone who didn't grow up with it that is until r66y is being beaten to death by his friends for being different while begging you not to hurt them because they're his friends <laughs> that's the first time i've been moved by a game so old yeah, uh this impressive. is I completely forgot about that robo sequence. That was messed up. That was messed up. up. Yeah. <laughs> I, wrote, I wrote down that too. Yeah. How of, long oh they linger God. on it too? Because it's like he's, he moves at, like they, he moves positions trying to get away from them and they continue yeah. like to, yeah, to pile on him. Just, just a moment where he's like, wait, I'm a defect for trying to not 
kill humans. It's I'm just different. Like, yeah, he's struggling so badly. Uh, yeah. Lazarus A said, um, oh, this is a slight tangent. But he said he had a poster of Chrono Trigger on his bedroom wall when he was 11 because as an Australian Nintendo magazine, they did a cover story preview. But he was never actually playing the Super Nintendo version because it didn't come out in Australia until 2009 on the DS. Oh, and playing wow. through it now, I recognize all the characters from that poorly drawn poster. Um, so <laughs> thoughts? Uh, seeing Robo get beaten up by his former buddies had more of an emotional impact on me than anything in Rise of Skywalker. <laughs> <laughs> come on. Uh, yes, that was so dark and so bizarre. And just like the fact that he's trying to defend them and save them. Did you... In a Star Wars way, did you buy his turn? Did you buy then where he's like, you know what? I guess I can rally with you guys. Ah, yeah, sure. I mean, he was pre-programmed, right? It, it, so. Yeah, he's pre-programmed. I do, I do like that. You know, Marley expresses like, well, okay, hold on. Are you sure you can fix him so he doesn't kill us? And yeah, yeah. And she's like, yeah, I know. I got, I got, I do machines. I got. Yeah, where <laughs> where did she get that confidence from? This like yeah. technology is like thousands of years in the yeah. future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Craig Hernandez uh, says one thing that hit me in the feels was Robo finding out that he's defective. He doesn't seem. He doesn't try to fight back against his robot brethren as they beat him and even asks you not to harm them before they toss him in a scrap shoot. I also found it made the moment even more depressing as no matter how much you move Chrono or try to interact with the fight, the game won't allow you, making you feel completely helpless. The music paired really set the mood. Will Channel, however, likes the game, but he points out, at the end of these five hours, to the, uh, up to the end of time, there have been a lot of cool moments that I think have been hindered by a nearly breakneck pace. Speaking of Rise of Skywalker, was that simply JRPGs of the era? I'm not sure, but there have been a lot of story beats so far that haven't gotten enough time to breathe. An example is Robo's decision to go with the group. He's treated like a human rather than a machine, immediately accepts it, and then, bam, through the portal, they're ready to go. I felt like I would have liked that moment to be more fleshed out. I, I appreciate the, how fast the game moves yeah, overall, and it's I not, think. I don't think it's a... Uh... Because that was another part of their question. like, is this just how 16-bit JRPGs were? No. No, I think Chrono Trigger just has just a crazy pace to it which well, I like yeah. yeah well that's Andrew Valla he wrote in saying this is only my second time playing Chrono Trigger but I was shocked at how quickly the game gets you into action there's no exposition dump like in Final Fantasy 6 or tutorial prompts every few seconds Chrono's mom tells you to get your lazy ass out of bed and you're out in the open world a minute later depending on how much you dork around at the fair you're traveling mm -hmm. through time and battling enemies in less than 20 minutes I'm struggling to recall other RPGs of this era that get moving so fast yeah I think that actually kind of helps it a little bit as like uh, you know, one of those classics that everyone talks about really fondly is because I think that in the same way that, like, you know, the sprites kind of let you fill in the gaps, it's like, well, this is like what my, like, you know, headcanon, like, su super immersive version of this game would be like is like in this, you know, what, like, really drawn out story. I think the fact that the game moves so quickly kind of has you fill in story gaps that way as well, as well as like, oh, in like the, you know, the super expensive version of this game, you know, like, if they were to remake Chrono Trigger the way they are Final Fantasy VII, it'd be like, oh, yeah, there'd be like, this whole factory would be like five hours of just like, who is Robo as a robot? You know, like, uh, so I think that helps with like, oh yeah, no, it has a really good story because like partially because I filled in a lot of those gaps with like, with my own kind of storytelling, mm -hmm. and I think I think you know because it it feels more dense. I I imagine people remember this game as like being more dense than it is. It, it just feels like it's moving really quickly. Is yeah. what actually is the case? Yeah. Uh, just like in this sequence, Dan Willie says one of the stranger items you can find in the game is called Naga Bromide. You grab this item early on in the cathedral. It won't show up in your inventory, but if you leave a particular house in Dorino, an old man will stop you and beg for you to trade it in exchange for the key to a drawer in his house containing a magic capsule. A Japanese bromide is essentially an erotic pinup photo, and nagas are the snake ladies you fight in the cathedral posing as nuns. <laughs> Needless to say, uh -huh. the guy has unique tastes. Uh, he yeah. knows what he likes. Hey. Speaking, of, speaking of that nun, uh, like the cathedral, like the most obvious foreshadowing of like, this is a bad, like I have the quotes here. Uh, like just the things that they say, like, oh, we pray for the peace of our world. We are ever so devout. Tee hee hee. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and then just like the fact that they're like, oh, how delicious. I mean, delightful looking you are. <laughs> oh, great Lord and master, deliver your judgment upon the weak and undeserving, which is just like they're not even trying to hide it at this point. <laughs> uh, Serial, this one's for you. <gasps> Zach Thornhill says this year discovered Akira Toriyama's manga, Dr. Slump a comedy about a scientist and a robot girl he makes. This was Toriyama's first big hit before Dragon Ball. I think Mr. Toriyama designed Luca as an homage to his robot girl, Arale, how do you pronounce it? Arale? Arale. Arale? I think so. Anyways, um, Luca's like a combination of Balma and Arale from Dr. Slump. Do you see any similarity there? A little bit. Like, I mean, I haven't... I, I don't think, like, Luca's had her story arc yet that I... You know, she, has, she hasn't been the focus of much of the game yet. Um, but... 
I feel like I see a lot more Bulma than I see Aureli personally because I yeah. think Aureli is like super yeah. naive, not really knowing any. She doesn't like she like, literally the whole joke with her. She doesn't know how powerful she is uh, as as like a robot, and like that hasn't really been the case with with Luca, and, and she feels <laughs> I more. Think like, she knows exactly how powerful she is. Uh, yeah. yeah uh, but she feels a lot more like I'm getting a lot more Bulma than I am really from Sure. Her. Jonathan Dressel says, in my first playthrough of the game, I was not expecting to be blown away by moving the text between the top and bottom of the screen by pressing Y on the Super Nintendo. I don't know why, but I was always impressed by that UI detail. Tim Laro wants to know if we renamed our companions. Um, and then he goes on to give some spoilers. But thank you, Tim. Um, no, I didn't. I wanted to keep it nice and straight. So yeah, I wasn't confused. I I initially had that plan. I mean, I named Chrono Chronic, but like other than that, like <laughs> how do you spell? It? Did you did you remove C- the H? C R O N. Yeah. Good job. Very smart. <laughs> I renamed R six. What what Robo is he? Just supposed to be Roby? Robo. Robo. I Robo. think I did Reg- Reggie as close to Reggie as I could get because it's R six six Y. Like R G G. Oh, also, it was a Fiza May reference. Yeah, <laughs> it was weird. And they're like, "What's your name?" And he's like, "R six six Y." He's like, "That's no good. Let's rename you." It's like maybe he was proud of that. <laughs> like, didn't even give him a I chance. like that name. <laughs> I will not. My be mother dissuaded. gave it to me. <laughs> Uh, Travis Mannix says, while Chrono Trigger is one of my favorite games, one of my biggest gripes with it is the fact that... Two ends. <laughs> <laughs> Chrono is a silent protagonist. Oh, sure. I personally don't love this convention in most instances, but I found it especially out of place here. The entire world, places, and especially characters are so fleshed out and full of life that to have a mannequin of a main character just feels empty and passive. I feel like the silent protagonist thing can work in games where you're playing a custom-made character or one with many play styles, but Chrono is such a specific character between his look, combat, style, the characters, and his relations to them. I feel like he should have been given a voice. It is weird, especially because... It's implying that, I don't think Zelda does this, but it's like implying that he is talking, right? Mm-hmm. Like they're like, yeah. everybody's reacting to him. Like, what do you mean it's not fair? And it's like that type of thing. Where it's like, eh, there's not even like an ellipses. Yeah. No, it, it, it does feel a little weird Yeah, yeah. in this in, in this instance. I, I think mean, it's because he's like a Toriyama design character. He's so distinct and interesting looking that it's like, it's weird that he ultimately doesn't really have a personality. You well, know? it must have come from Yuji Horii, right? From Dragon Quest? I'd imagine that that's oh, like just insistent on that's a like a staple, or like yeah. oh, let's take it from the Dragon Quest series for this. Right? Maybe, yeah, yeah. or really, even like the earlier like pre four Final Fantasies. But I, uh, uh, I, I think it helps. This is where like the pacing of the game actually helps a lot because it, it because almost immediately it feels like you're part of this ensemble cast. So it's not there's not a lot of time for you to think about. Oh yeah, he's not really talking because so many of the scenes are like okay now Mar- Marlon and Luke are gonna, ha- are gonna have this conversation. Then the Chancellor comes in and like yeah like the 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 game was so quickly that I barely noticed that he was silent. But yeah. it is totally like I would like Chrono to be involved in these conversations you know like it, it's it's it does feel oddly missing now that he points it out for sure well, hang on you guys are talking out loud in your bedrooms right like as you play mm-hmm. what's like, that Hanson like we're talking out loud in our bedrooms <laughs> uh Joe Juba says uh I cannot believe that this is the first game that Mitsuda scored right out of the gate he made one of the best game soundtracks of all time though I think Mitsuda topped it with Chrono Cross yes Chrono Cross has a better soundtrack I'm sorry everybody um music was probably the third biggest talker is everybody saying holy mother of god so yeah, that the, battle theme is one of my favorites i love that are theme. you serious this yeah. is interesting because both chrono cross is my favorite soundtrack of all time uh but both chrono cross and chrono trigger as much as i love the soundtracks battle themes i'm not crazy about it neither no really no yeah no, no i love the battle theme some good hi-hat action up in there. uh somebody else agrees with me so will channel says the battle theme for some reason strikes me as so generic compared to the rest of the frankly awesome music that i think kyle hilliard's wrong and he should shave his head in embarrassment mm. i'm looking over your shoulder and it doesn't yeah, say no, that that's but weird. i'll take that's your weird. word for it uh yeah so the story is apparently that mitsuda got brought onto the project um to compose for the first time and boy did he give it his all uh he got stomach ulcers because he was so stressed out from the project so he wasn't able to finish it and then they brought um who's the final fantasy guy why am i Nomura? Forgetting? no U- U- cloud oh Sakaguchi? Ma- <laughs> not <laughs> wait uh, uamatsu yeah uamatsu, uamatsu. uamatsu and and okay. he wrote a couple tracks i wish i knew which one were the uamatsu tracks though mm. and which one were mm. the mitsuda i mean the bulk is mitsuda but. i mean the, the stomach ulcers was when he was writing the battle theme then right? that's right he said <laughs> oh i hope no one likes this garbage no uh david blessman says frog's intro in the cathedral with the various music changes from when you first enter battle then when he hops in it's the best musical sequence but the best music he says is the fair yeah the fair is a nice catchy thing for mm. sure um, Taylor Owen says, now I'm not 
a nostalgic person, even though I had a Super Nintendo, I never played Chrono Trigger as a kid. Nevertheless, when I played it on DS for the first time four years ago, stepped into the overworld and heard Memories of Green, which is the overworld theme, mm. I was hit with a feeling of wonder and mystery I hadn't felt since at least 1997. The music in this game is so powerful. I watched a video from 8-Bit Music Theory that said Mitsuda used non-functional harmonies to create an ethereal feel to the soundtrack. I don't know what it means, but I do know that if I dare to listen to the soundtrack late at night, I will get emotional. Mm. Jared Natsis says, slap of the bass. The one bass part that always hits me is in the Secret of the Forest track. Um, it's hard to pick a best song, but this is definitely in the in the top section. Uh, Trevor Lavos says, wait, wait, Lavos? 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 No! No! <laughs> he says, the music is awesome, of course, but I had an amazing experience that reinforced the serendipitous timing of playing the game for the first time for the deepest dive. I went to Pack South in San Antonio this weekend, and one of the main attractions was a concert on Friday night with the performance by the Mariachi Entertainment System, a local mariachi ga- band that played video game tunes. They rocked out to the main Chrono Trigger theme, as well as a song from Guardia Millennial Fair, and the crowd went nuts. <laughs> Being able to recognize the song was a joy, and the rest of the show was incredible, too. I never would have known that they were playing it if I hadn't started the game for the game club. That's very sweet. Do you think we can find this? The polka? I was actually... Polka. Oh, I, I, mariachi. I don't know why I got the genres <laughs> all confused. Uh, yeah, I would love to share, because like, there's a lot of covers of a lot of different Chrono Trigger music. I think it would be fun. If, I don't know if you guys like are into that at all, but I have a couple tracks that like I love. Like There's jazz covers of the battle theme and stuff like that that maybe we should share at some point. Yeah. Okay, so here is the mariachi entertainment system. See, he's got an accordion, so I'm not insane. <laughs> they got that part down. Oh, I got some harp action going here. Very no, good. good. Very that's good. good. The mariachi Entertainment System, we're going to give them some love. Yeah, I feel like we could do a whole bonus video or thing just about the music in the game. Yeah. Do you guys have a track that stands out? Uh, I like the battle theme. <laughs> yeah, but one that isn't mediocre. Um, <laughs> no, it's still Frog's theme for me. And then I don't know what it is. I forget what track it is, but it's when you're uh, you talk to a woman at a piano and she plays a track. You pay her like 10 gold or something. She plays a track on the piano. I, was like, I think that might be my favorite of this section so far. Mm-hmm. Outside of the Max cr- Payne thing? It's the Max Payne <laughs> theme. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, how are you guys feeling about the future of Chrono Trigger? Well, it looks dark, so we got to say that. <laughs> we, we really got to do our own. Uh, yeah. I'm a little intimidated because I think this is the, at the, the point at which it kind of diverges and you know our paths could be kind of different. I don't, I don't know how like... Or are you tackling time periods in a particular order, or is it like, well, you could do this thing first, and then you go in this place, and like, like I'm I'm a little scared that I'll end up getting lost, which I think one of the reasons I'm liking the game as much as I am is because I, I it's like yeah. from point A to point B super quickly. Yeah. So I think there are a couple choices you can make. I'm I'm hazy on this game. It's been so long. Um, people were saying that it doesn't fully really diverge until kind of the end chunk where you can do a bunch of optional side quests and stuff like that. So I think. Even if it does spread out and there are some options here, it will coalesce before the stopping point. So we're going to speed things along a little bit. Hopefully you've been playing along with us with Chrono Trigger. But we're going to air the next episode of The Deepest Dive next week because we got a lot to get through, folks. And so next week for the next episode, it'll be airing on January 29th. We'll have the post on Patreon, patreon.com slash minmax 2 ends um, on the 27th, looking for your specific, specific feedback. Thank you for everybody that wrote in with such good things. Yeah. So write in with, like, you know, your favorite things, favorite moments, least favorite thing, like that type of specific beat. Um, so the stopping point next time around is going to be the Kingdom of Zeal. So once you go to a new era and there's floating islands and the first area is called Enhasa, E-N-H-A-S-A, stop there. And I think when you go to Enhasa, somebody says something like, welcome to the Kingdom of Zeal. So okay. floating islands, so Kingdom of get Zeal. to it. That's yes. Stop. Okay. stop right there. You can save on the world map if you want, and that's going to be the stopping point. This is going to be the biggest chunk, so we're going to have a ton to talk about. Um, but I hope everybody's up for it. And honestly, if you're like, oh, my gosh, that's too much to, to play, it's probably around 10 hours or so before next week, that's totally fine. Just send some feedback on whatever you get through. Like, you don't need to finish it before you send feedback. Don't let that hold you back, you know? There's going to be people that will send feedback on the entire thing. But thanks to everybody that's playing along with us. It is stunning to see. It's really yeah, it's humbling. And it's so exciting to see so many, see so many people, like, 
going back to this game they've heard about for so long and that they're actually enjoying it. We're not mm -hmm. torturing the community. <laughs> it's a plus. It's always nice when we're not torturing the community. <laughs> That's right. Uh, if you like this format, um, if you played The Outer Worlds, we also recently did a deepest dive in The Outer Worlds. You can find that on uh, our YouTube channel. You can check it out there, or you can get the audio version again by supporting us on Patreon, and you unlock the audio version of this, max spoilers, uh, a bunch of other bonus audio aspects and things thrown in there as well, commentary tracks, things like that. So we'll have even more in the future. But hey, thanks for joining us, everybody. And uh, we'll see you next week for everything up until the Kingdom of Zeal. Great. Chrono Trigger! Yeah. yeah! Content like this is supported by the community on patreon.com slash minmax. And if you continue to support us and you're here long enough, you can even eventually hear me talk about Breath of the Wild too. Check us out. Thank you so much.